But we forgot we live in Michigan, right? And so anything can happen in Michigan, right? <laughs> so um, let me let um, our guest speaker and our um, uh, Dr. Wadsworth go ahead and sit down, and then I'll introduce. Are we sitting? Yeah. Okay. So good morning, good morning again. I'm going to try to use this microphone and hold my phone at the same time. Um, again, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference. Um, it's a biennial conference, and so we are thankful that you are here this morning. Let me introduce first our um, um, resident nurse. Dr. Pamela Wadsworth is an associate professor in the Bronson School of Nursing, and she's going to help us lead the conversation with Dr. Jackson this morning. He gave a wonderful talk on yesterday, and so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that conversation. So this won't be the same as yesterday. If you want to see yesterday's, then you should. No, no, it'll be available. It'll be available for you um, um, probably on our website. But today, we're going to just dive a little bit into it. Um, we had a book discussion. The college had a book discussion. And um, so in January and February, we started reading the book. We started having conversation about the book. And so we're going to talk more about it. So I don't know, think I can do this. OK, Pam, hold this for me. I want to make sure I get this right. Okay. Thank you. So, Dr. James Jackson, thank you for coming again. He, we are so excited. He came home. He came to see his family, and then he decided to come and hang out with us a little bit. So, we appreciate you. Um, he's an internationally renowned expert on long COVID and its, effect, its effects on cognitive and mental health functioning. He's a licensed psychologist specializing in neuropsychology and cognitive rehabilitation, and he is the uh, research associate professor of medicine, psychiatry, and behavioral sciences, and director of long-term outcomes, ICU Recovery Center in the Department of Medicine at Vanderbilt University. There's so much more to both of these folks that I could tell you, but I know that you're going to Google it anyway, so it'll be just fine. Please <laughs> welcome Dr. Jackson and Dr. Pamela Wadsworth. You're going to need that. Okay. All right. Thank you. I feel nervous. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for coming, and um, thank you for your talk last night. It was really, really interesting, and your book. Um, one of the things we talked a lot about in our book group, which was very helpful, was the, um, and it was, it was intended for people suffering from long COVID and um, their relatives, but as a healthcare providers and health and human services, we're wondering if you had any explicit tips for us to help people with long COVID. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I, I was on the airplane, uh, I guess it was just yesterday, actually, it seems like a long time ago, yesterday morning early. And uh, I don't remember them saying this, but I'm sure they did say it because they always say it. They always say, um, God forbid, if there's an emergency and the mask drops down, you know, put your own mask on first and then you can help other people uh, better. And I do think that's not just a mantra. I, I think that's something really important for us to embrace as healthcare providers and professionals. Um, the work that we do if we work with people with chronic illness, whether it's uh, mental illness or physical illness of, of some kind or other, I think it's stressful. I think it's really challenging. Uh, you know, certainly for me, the, the work during this pandemic season has been rewarding and it's been difficult. So to the extent that it is difficult, I think we really do need to put on our own, again, to use the analogy, um, our own face mask first. So we can take care of ourselves. And as we take care of ourselves, we're better equipped to take care of other people. You know, I think the milieu, the culture 
has changed a lot in that um, I think we're aware, at least as healthcare providers and as academics, that we need to engage in self-care. But I think for many, um, it is still something very aspirational and not something that we really prioritize. And I would invite people here to really prioritize that. You know, don't make those empty words, but really focus on taking care of yourself because that will equip you. The other thing I would say is as we care for people with chronic illnesses, long COVID or otherwise, um, let's not try to do that by ourselves. If we're able to join arms with people from other disciplines or professions, let's try to do that. Because I think patients are enriched when we are working with colleagues that really make us better and make them better. Thank you. Yeah. It kind of leads to my next um, I just want to state, one of, we were just talking, Dr. Harrison and I, in the hallway about what we individually got from the book as healthcare providers and um, healthcare professionals is that I, as a nurse, and a lot of my nursing colleagues re regularly talk about how physicians sideline us and we feel ignored and no one knows how important we are. And reading the book, I got the, I, I understood how important SLPs are and um, occupational therapists, and we've sidelined them a lot in our own. So thank you for that. Um, on a sort of related level, um, because we, it, is, it is easy to say the words for self-care and hard to do, um, on a systematic level or systems level, what do you think we can do to help survivors of COVID and healthcare professionals, all of us, so we can take care of ourselves better? It's a really great question and, and a complicated one. Um, I, I think for survivors, one of the key things we can do is really believe them. I, you know, I think that's a simple thing. That won't solve the problem, of course, but I think a lot of them have run into situations where they feel dismissed and marginalized, uh, disbelieved, uh, if that's a word. And um, I, I don't think believing them means that we have to agree with them about everything, about their perspectives. Uh, my perspectives on some things are distorted, I'm sure. Um, just because you have long COVID, that doesn't mean you're absolutely right about everything, right? And, and, and I think, um, as a psychologist at least, there are times where I can point out a bit that um, you've got a blind spot or two or three or 10. But I think um, believing them and, and being willing to embrace their experience and, and not um, shaming or dismissing, I, I think that's a strategy that has high value that is relatively easy to do. Um, I think advocating for them is also really important. Uh, we went to dinner, many of us, uh, last night, and, and it was really lovely. Uh, this is a side note, but as... Uh, as a boy, the Black Swan restaurant in Kalamazoo was the place to be. And uh, I never went, uh, only went to one prom, but that was a popular place to go for prom. So um, we were eating at, at Martel's restaurant, it used to be the Black Swan, and talked a little bit about issues of advocacy. And, and I think um, some healthcare providers are not dialed in, if you will, to the idea that advocacy is, is part of their role with patients. Uh, I very much think it is, and um, I think it's a moral obligation, candidly, that we have to advocate for our patients, whatever that means. So that's something that I think we can do that is really helpful. Um, you know, I've led so many courses with nurses and physicians on resiliency. I've, uh, I've led so many support groups. Um, I think those are effective. Uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure how effective. It's interesting, uh, during the pandemic, I led a support group for nurses and physicians, uh, two separate support groups, both groups of people working in the ICU. And um, the nurses were quite willing to agree or, or address issues of, of distress and, and vulnerability and struggle. The physicians were really reluctant. Like we'd get on and I'd say, how are you? And they'd say, fine. Uh, it seemed impossible that they were fine. Um, so I really appreciated the way that nurses engaged. But I think a criticism of, of this approach, of this approach of, of offering support groups or trainings is that uh, it can make it appear that we're doing really good things when we're not addressing the structural dynamics that are also important, which would include let's hire more people and uh, let's pay people more. And so those are complicated issues to address. But um, I think things like resilience training, 
they're not nothing. You know, they're n they're not everything. They're they're not nothing. Um, so the more we can in attend to the to the needs of of our colleagues, I think the better off we are. How how we do that exactly, I'm not sure, but but making that a priority, um, making that the tail that wags the dog in some ways, I think is exactly what we should be doing. Thank you. Um, when you said um, not believing them, but not necessarily agreeing with them, made me think of one of my next questions, which was, um, to, I, if you've noticed that long COVID has is impact, been impacted by the political divide. So I had a um, repair person come into my home after I had just started reading your book, and he said, um, there was a long monologue about how the COVID vaccine caused his long COVID. And I'm wondering if you heard that or you know, have addressed that in your groups or seen that at all. It's a hugely complicated issue, this issue of, of vaccine injury, I think is a term that people use. I get probably an email a week, perhaps, from someone who talks about being vaccine injured. And um, I'm, not, um, I'm not close to the idea that in the universe of vaccines, um, there are people who have been injured by vaccines. I'm sure that happens. Uh, I just think it's a matter of course that's not a routine outcome. And, and I think uh, to the extent that it could occasionally or rarely happen, um, the benefits of the vaccine vastly overwhelm. You know, I was on a podcast um, probably nine months ago. I was on so many. I was on about 30 over a span of, of several months, most of them with very few listeners. So many of you have never <laughs> heard me on those podcasts, but, but on about 30. And um, they're all different. They're interesting. And, uh, you know, you don't necessarily vet them very much, or I didn't. And you don't know what people are going to ask you exactly. And uh, I was on one that started transitioning into what seemed like pretty sketchy ground. And um, he started asking about vaccines as a, as a driver of cognitive problems in particular, had a clear agenda. And I actually turned off my computer as we were having that conversation. Uh, didn't want to go on any further with him. And, and uh, it was live. It was really uncomfortable. So um, I, I think you're putting your finger on a real phenomenon. And I think uh, how to deal with it is complicated. I, you know, I don't have the answer to that. I, I, I do think this issue of, of long COVID is hugely politicized. I see it on Twitter all the time. And, um, and I think um, it's politicized, frankly, and, and I try to live in, in the uncomfortable middle a lot. And I think um, societally that's a hard place to be, you know, these days. So I think um, if you, and I'm not a political guy, I should, I should clarify that. Um, I, I, I think if you look at uh, political perspectives, um, people on the right, on the far right, um, are completely dismissive often of the possibility of long COVID, right? That's in your head, you've made it up, you're lazy, you just need to bite the bullet and get to work, whatever. Um, when you head to the other extreme, um, I hear from people who say things like, you recorded a video in your office, Dr. Jackson, I saw it on the internet, why were you not wearing a mask, right? And, um, I, you know, my response is, I mean, why would I be wearing a mask, right? I'm in my office. No one else is in my office. I don't routinely work with a mask on. So um, I, I think there is a way to respect people from all positions, and we should. Um, but I think fear has crept in. Uh, it's problematic. And I think uh, in some ways, long COVID is a little bit like Rorschach test. I don't know if there are other psychologists here, but, but some of you remember if, if you did, um, taking a Rorschach class. I, I, I took one. I wasn't really a fan of the Rorschach test. I'm not very detailed. It's hard to score responses. But I show you a picture of something or, or, or nothing, anything, and uh, you tell me that's, uh, that's two gorillas eating a banana or, uh, you know, that's a rabid squirrel or, uh, you know, whatever it is. It looks like nothing, right? And the theory is that you're projecting a lot of your dynamics onto that card and that that's going to be revealing. And I really do think, for good or for bad, long COVID has become a bit of a Rorschach test. You know, we project um, perspectives that we have onto it, 
And uh, I think that's partly why we need to work in community, frankly, so that people can correct me when I need correcting and say, Jim, you know, you're minimizing this, or Jim, um, you're making too big a deal of this, or Jim, uh, your perspective on this patient and what they're saying isn't exactly clear. Uh, I think it's partly why we need people in our lives who are going to help um, keep us honest and, and help make sure that we're addressing whatever blind spots we have because I think long COVID is a Rorschach test. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a Rorschach test for our nation too. And my next that? question was, and you addressed it a little bit last night, but um, COVID hit um, communities of color and poor people so much harder than it did for those of us who could work in our office. And um, I'm wondering, in your book, you, you you had various stories, which was one of the things I really appreciated the best of each of the, the patients suffering in a diverse audience. I'm wondering if you experienced, um, if you could speak to long COVID in communities of color and how that might be different or other marginalized populations, LGBTQ community. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there are huge disparities and inequities as a practical matter, huge challenges um, across the board. Um, not too long ago, I saw a patient, I don't think I mentioned this in the book, although I may have, and um, she has long COVID, had long COVID, has, I imagine, long COVID, and um, has a lot of cognitive challenges, in particular, a delightful lady. And I said, uh, and, and a woman with a lot of resources and a lot of means, and I said, uh, you know, I think we can refer you to cognitive rehab and probably will be helpful. And she said, you know, I'm open to that potentially, but she said, um, before I would do that, I would probably hire a 24-7 assistant to live in my house and they could help me offset the cognitive problems I'm having. And um, I had to conceal a little bit of a laugh thinking, oh, wow, you know, what is that like? Exactly, right? You're going to hire a full-time assistant. You don't need rehab. Um, that's not the world that most of us inhabit, right? Most of us cannot uh, solve our problems by hiring a 24-7 a, a assistant. Neither can most of us hire um, a concierge medicine service, if you will. I, recently, I was contacted by someone in California and their entire job, I, I have no issue with it, but most people can't access it. Their entire job is um, a patient calls them with a rare disease or whatever the problem is they have, and um, they reach out to who they identify as the world's leading expert and call them and say, can you be involved in this patient's care? How can I facilitate that? That's their job. So, um, so that's not available, that option, to most people, right? So we see very clear um, differences along lines of income. Um, I think we see clear differences in challenges uh, along racial lines, certainly as well. And um, I think we see a lot of uh, distrust appropriately, right? Historically and appropriately among people of color related to um, efforts and initiatives that the government is promising will make you better. And I think um, very often when I've interacted with um, people of color, they think um, in the early days of the vaccine, many of them would tell me, um, I'm familiar with Tuskegee. I, you know, I'm familiar with the government trying to help, and, and that didn't go so well, right? Um, so a lot of skepticism in um, evangelical Christian communities, frankly, uh, and, and uh, southwestern Michigan is, is an area where um, you know, there's quite a large Christian community huge skepticism about the vaccine, a huge barrier, frankly. Uh, so um, really big differences, really big challenges, people who feel um, quite alone and marginalized. Uh, I think many physicians, some well-meaning and some not, um, who do what they did to the physician that I discussed in the, um, in the lecture yesterday, where um, you don't look like me, you don't sound like me, and I'm gonna make some assumptions about who you are, and um, I'm not gonna provide you the same help that I otherwise would. So I think it's an uphill battle. Um, you pointed out correctly, this isn't just a COVID problem, this is a national problem, right? And I don't know how we're gonna solve it. I, I, I think one way we're gonna to begin to solve it, um, and I acknowledge it's more complicated than this, is um, we're gonna solve it by you and I and all of us beginning to realize the ways that we participate in this system 
um, and create injustice ourselves the way that we allow our own behaviors to be dictated by biases, conscious or unconscious. I think as I address mine and you address yours and we address ours, um, that's a move in the right direction, it seems to me. Well, I have one more question, and then I think we're going to open it up, right? Um, and my question is, um, we came up as a reading group of many ideas for your future with this book. Um, and, and we'd be very willing to tell you what we think you should do, but we're wondering what you plan to do with the future of this book, because we think it has a lot of potential. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there, there's a lot to say about this, and I'm mindful of your time, so I, I won't say everything that I think there is to say about this. Um, but there's a lot to say. Um, I approached my publisher, uh, Tracy Behar is, is her name, actually my editor at Little Brown, um, recently, and I said, um, could we make this book, could we take this book and change the title perhaps, and could we make it about chronic illness in general, like writ large, could we make it about chronic illness? Because, um, I, you know, many of the people that have reached out to me frankly about the book, and, and I get a lot of emails and phone calls and one person has shown up at my door, which is a little weird, but uh, you know, it's okay. Actually, she's shown up a couple times, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, so, um, so a lot of people report that they've been impacted by the book. But many of the people who've been impacted by the book are not people um, with long COVID, or people with other chronic illnesses who just happened to find it, and and it's been helpful. So the um, the end of that story, uh, my interaction with Tracy was that she said no. You know, we cannot rebrand the book, and um, I I, th I think it wasn't that she wasn't interested in that, but there are orthodoxies and protocols, and I guess it's not just as simple as crossing out, you know, the word long COVID and slapping on the word cry. You know, it's more complicated. So we're not doing that. Um, I initially had, um, had thought of writing a second book, which was going to be about OCD, my own journey with OCD. And those of you who've read the book or have heard me in other contexts have heard me talk about um, a struggle with OCD in my life that started in, in 2018. And um, that, that journey with OCD was in some ways um, fodder or inspiration, what, whatever you want to say, for this book in that... Um, when I was diagnosed with OCD, I, I quickly realized that I didn't want OCD. You know, I desperately didn't want to have OCD. And, um, and I thought, um, naively, that someone could wave a magic wand and take away my OCD. You know, and, and the psychologist that I got to know, Jenny Thigpen, uh, highly recommend her, um, she and I battled a lot for a year or so with me saying, we've got to fix this OCD, and her saying, um, you know, you need to find a way to live with OCD. We'll try to fix it, but you need to find a way to live with it. And, and that insight proved to be hugely valuable for me because I started realizing, you know, if I can live with a chronic illness that I didn't want, that, that I didn't ask for, maybe my long COVID patients equally, you know, can learn to live with a chronic illness. Uh, I think many of our patients, again, whatever their challenges are, the way they frame things often, and I did the same, so no criticism here, the way they frame things often is, if you can just take away this problem, you know, whatever it is, if you could just take it away, everything will be fine, right? Well, to start with, that's not true, right? Because everybody has some problems, right? Uh, whatever they are, but it'd be lovely, right? It'd be lovely not to have vision problems or schizophrenia or OCD or long COVID or lupus or MS or Alzheimer's, you know, whatever. Um, but, but I think this framing, specific to long COVID, this framing of if you can take my long COVID away, I'll be fine. But if you can't, nothing will ever be fine. And I'm going to sit at the railroad station basically waiting for the train to take my long COVID away instead of living, right? That's really problematic, I think. And that's what I was doing with my OCD until I started realizing, um, you know, maybe there's a way to learn to live with this, right? Maybe there's a way, and this seemed uh, inconceivable, to even embrace it, right? To be empowered by it, to learn to notice it instead of be controlled by it. Um, and that's the message in some ways of the book. And so, uh, so I pitched an idea about an OCD book that, that would advocate that approach to mental illness, living with. And... Um, when you publish a book, and I, you know, I'm learning all of this as I go, but uh, the publishers need to be convinced they can find a way to market it. They need to be convinced that it has a lane, um, a niche, 
And so the OCD book was a book they were interested in. They didn't think at the end of the day there was a niche. And so um, I, had, I had casually mentioned another book. I had thrown a lot of things against the wall early in the process of writing this book. I'd casually mentioned a, another book. And that book was about uh, medical trauma, about the idea that there are huge numbers of people who have been traumatized by, you name it, either being diagnosed with a chronic illness or um, having cancer, having a heart attack, having a miscarriage, having a child in the NICU. You know, there's so many pathways to trauma, to medical trauma, to PTSD. And I think often with PTSD in particular, and, and that's not the only thing that results from medical trauma, anxiety and depression and personality changes, all of that. But if we think of PTSD, I think there's this notion that um, combat is a trauma, sexual assault is a trauma, and to be sure, those things are traumas. But I think there are 101 other forms of trauma that we often don't identify as trauma. And when we see people in intensive care, for instance, and that's my stock and trade, that's the group that I initially worked with the most, um, being on a ventilator and not being able to speak and not being able to communicate and, and having you know, psychotic, delusional dreams and nightmares for weeks at a time, um, that's really traumatic. You know, being delirious is hugely traumatic. Um, they don't do it so much anymore, but, but having your arms, you know, tied down while you're on a ventilator is hugely traumatic. And um, we have seen in that population, we've seen rates of PTSD that are every bit as high as we see in the Vietnam combat vets, let's say, that I work with at the, at the Nashville VA who are getting a little long in the tooth, but, you know, one in five of them or so. Um, they battle PTSD. So, uh, so this new book doesn't have a name yet. Literally, right now, I need to be working on it. You know, I probably need to be working on it this afternoon. Um, but it will be a self-help guide for people with medical trauma that will be um, kind, importantly, and I think really empowering. The, the, the challenge with medical trauma, and this is a long answer, so thanks for indulging me. I'll, I'll try to wrap this up. But uh, the challenge with medical trauma is that um, with many forms of trauma, if we take combat as one, um, if I was in a firefight in Fallujah, let's say, or two or three or four, um, I can avoid going to Fallujah, right? Now, now, that won't solve the problem, but I can avoid going to Fallujah, and I can avoid watching war movies, and I can avoid perhaps um, going to places where I might hear a gunshot. You know, there are things I can avoid, right? And, and I may, in that avoidance, not be triggered so much. But if the trauma is residing in my body, right, because of a medical event, um, I can't avoid that trauma so much. And the avoidance, um, again, for some people with PTSD is not really helpful, but for some, not hugely harmful, depending on the nature of things. Medical avoidance can be hugely harmful. You know, there's a colleague at Columbia University um, um, Edmondson is his, is his last name, um, blanking on his first name, Don, Donald Edmondson. And he's done a lot of work on PTSD and cardiac arrest. And just to, just to put a fine point on this, um, he studied a cohort of people who had had cardiac arrests um, who developed PTSD and who didn't develop PTSD. And uh, he tracked those two groups over time. And his research question involved what would happen to those people if they had new cardiac symptoms with a history of PTSD without. And, and what he predicted, and indeed what he found, was that if you had new cardiac symptoms without a diagnosis of PTSD, you would do what most of us would do, which is you would call 911 or you would get in the, get in the car, drive to the hospital, whatever. Um, but if you had PTSD and had new cardiac problems, you would actually be really reluctant to do it. And he had one study that showed that that um, people with PTSD, after they had new cardiac problems, took two and a half times as long to go to the hospital, right? So for those of us who have even a rudimentary knowledge of, of cardiology or heart attacks or whatever, that's a life and death outcome, right? That, that instead of taking 30 minutes, you take 80 minutes. Or, uh, you know, instead of taking 10 minutes, you take almost 30. Um, so that's the problem we see with, with medical trauma that that people avoid going to the doctor, frankly. 
And um, as you know, the more you avoid things, the, the worse things get. And um, you wind up inviting the problem that you were trying to solve. So I'm really excited about that book in particular. And frankly, um, with regard to next steps, I really hope that I can do some collaborative work with, with you all. We'll figure out what that looks like. But, but that, would be, that would be so lovely. Uh, you know, I'm so impressed by this place, and it's so good to to come home, uh, you know, in my case, sleep in my own bedroom, which is kind of weird, you know, <laughs> where I was in 1972 or three. Uh, the bed's a little bigger, you know, than, than it was. I'm a little heavier than I, than I was, uh, but, uh, but it's good to be home. I'm so glad. I, I want to talk to you for hours, but I'm going to open it up to everyone else. So what other questions do you all have? Okay. So, Dr. Jackson, you were talking about um, people of color, and of course that, that um, relates to me in a lot of different ways. What I wondered is, is there a harder, is there, uh, are people of color less likely to be diagnosed with long COVID because of the fact that, you know, you always hear about um, people of color not being believed and, and there's an exaggeration. I, do, you see, do you see patients of color and, or, or do you have issues um, related to this area? probably does help. We were, in, we were in Paris, by the way, I, I'll answer this question, uh, Dr. Dennis. We were in Paris uh, a week ago, my wife and daughter and I, and I'm really loud. And um, Parisians have, I guess, a different sensibility that way than Americans, perhaps. And so on the subway and in museums especially, my daughter kept saying, Dad, quiet, be quiet, you know, quiet down, you're talking loud. So that's good in this forum, it's less good at Versailles or something. But um, but yeah, we do see people of color. The, the, the main place that I interact with people of color in my program is in our support groups, in our many support groups. And, um, and in that context, uh, you know, I think we see a, a couple of things. Um, we see them often feeling a little bit alone, I think, because they are, um, they are two African Americans, let's say, in a support group of 19 or 20 people and I think they have some sense that even though they are cared for and nurtured and loved, that their experience is distinct in some ways from that uh, of the other people in the group. So we work to alleviate that dynamic, but I don't think we can fix it completely. But, um, but the stories that they do tell us often are stories of feeling um, marginalized and, and disbelieved, and, and I do think um, that absolutely is what happens to them. Um, I would say that's what happens to many of our patients. So, so how much more that happens to them than others, I think it's hard to quantify. But I think it happens more to them than it does to others. I, I, I agree. I think this issue of being diagnosed or not diagnosed with long COVID is complicated. Um, many people in, in the United States would say that being diagnosed with long COVID didn't do very much for me. That is, as a practical matter, um, a lot of people carry a diagnosis of long COVID around, and it doesn't inform, sadly, their care very much at all. You know, they just have a label now, and uh, there's no long COVID clinic to go to. You know, Vanderbilt, we have a long COVID clinic. In the United States, there are, I want to say, 180 or so, I think. Some of them have closed down. Uh, you know, there was... Uh, as is often the case, there was a, um, an initial frantic effort to develop resources, and then you know the government declared the end of the pandemic, and and uh, stories about the pandemic are no longer on the front page of the New York Times. They're no longer in the news, and and people go back to normal pretty quickly. So a lot of people um, have not been diagnosed. But I think, with that being said, the experience of people with color is is unique and, and challenging, and I think um, that's borne out in studies uh, uh, such as the one I revealed last night, where outcomes really are different, you know, both for them and for people in the, um, in, in the uh, LB, uh, you know, lesbian, bisexual, queer communities, et, et cetera. Um, 
So uh, we've got a lot to do. We've got a lot to do to figure out what the mechanisms are of, of those differences in outcome. You know, why exactly are outcome di out outcomes different? Uh, I, I think we've got a lot to learn. Um, we're working on it, I think. You know, not fast enough. Hi. Hey um, there. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> okay. So I had a question um, in regard to like long COVID and um, other disasters, right? Um, I just finished my capstone project on occupational therapy's role in the disaster relief process. Yeah. So I was just wondering like, is that is something you considered like these huge or maybe small um, events right like so COVID in itself was an emergency like a disaster sure how do you have you ever considered like how COVID and long COVID would um, mix with other types of disasters may be it like man-made or natural or things of that nature like how that would impact the overall healing process of the community um, it's a really interesting question um, I, I, I think we've talked a lot about and and I appreciate the question. I, you know, we've talked a lot about, and I've talked a lot in my book about the idea that that there are people who develop mental health problems on the heels of getting COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in the world that we've lived in since the start of the pandemic, there are a lot of people who um, didn't develop COVID who have developed mental health problems just because they're living in the world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's hugely stressful, hugely difficult, really scary. Um, Early on in the pandemic, um, many of us, several of us gave a lecture at Vanderbilt uh, Medical Grand Rounds um, talking about managing uh, long COVID, it was, or managing COVID, the, the threat of COVID, it was to healthcare providers. And I remember very well, um, one of my psychology colleagues showed some slides and, and they were really beautiful. And she was talking about anxiety. And uh, in one slide, there was a, there was like a waterscape, there was a scene of the ocean and, and you could see the, the ocean and the horizon. And um, there was a little tiny speck on the horizon, on the ocean. And um, her comment was that there are some people who are wired long before COVID such that they will see a little speck on the water far away and will not even set their foot in the ocean because that could be a shark, right? Um, there are some people who will see something 200 yards offshore that will look like a shark and they'll jump right in the ocean and go swimming, right? Our, her point was we're wired really differently. And I think um, we were wired very different, differently, all of us, when the pandemic emerged. And I think for people with um, pre-existing inclinations toward things like anxiety, for instance, the pandemic has been hugely problematic right? Um, for people with a little OCD, let's say, it's been hugely problematic. For people who were already isolated, it's been hugely problematic. For people who um, tended to deal with stresses by things like drinking, let's say, we've seen, uh, uh, we did see a lot of recurrence in those behaviors. So I think to live in the world today since the start of the pandemic is really stressful. And, um, I, you know, I think if one thing the the pandemic has done, uh, if, if it's done one good thing, um, I think it is that it has elevated conversations about mental health and it has made those, I think, more acceptable and, and more normal. And um, I hope that's a process that we continue. You know, I talk about my own OCD. I don't know if all the time is quite fair, but I talk about it a lot, right? And. Um, and for a year or two, I wouldn't talk about it to anyone. It's really been healing for me to talk about it. And I think it's important, especially for those of us as leaders, to talk about our mental health story or our struggles, um, because I think that has a, a way of normalizing, right? And, and, um, and we need to do that and we should do that. And the pandemic, I think, has reminded us um, 
that we really need to do that. And it's a little more acceptable than it was. Maybe not a lot, but a little bit more. Other questions? Sometimes people with substance use disorder are not as believed about their medical conditions. Did you run into that with long COVID and trying to sort out symptom-wise which, which is which? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to think if, if I have seen that very much uh, in my work. I, I think I've seen a few cases where, where that has been true. Uh, I think in general, this topic, though, that you point to of people being disbelieved is something that we see, you know, so commonly. And, um, I, you know, we see it with different disciplines. I, I would say the, the group of physicians that are long COVID patients, I don't want to say hate, but the, I, I will say it. The group they hate the most um, are neurologists. They are particularly not fond of neurologists. And that, I think, is because... Um, very often the role that a neurologist has in the life of a patient with long COVID is they refer them for imaging. They often refer them for neuroimaging. And in general, it's not completely true, but, but for a majority of people with cognitive problems after long COVID, if they just do a typical 1.5 Tesla MRI or a three Tesla MRI, that normal MRI you get at Bronson or Borges or at Vanderbilt, um, their brains are gonna look fine fine in air quotes. So that neurologist invariably says, you know, your brain looks fine. And, and they take great offense at that. And, um, and I think it's fine that they do because, uh, you know, just because their MRI looks fine doesn't mean they look fine, right? I mean, I could open the hood up of my rental car and uh, it could look fine, the engine might not be fine, right? So, um, so people really are dismissed and marginalized and I think I think it's really sad and, I, you know, I think we just have to do better. I used the word kindness earlier and, um, gosh, I, I mean, I try to be kind imperfectly, right? But I, I try so hard to be kind. And um, sometimes I think, uh, why are we not kinder, you know, as a nation? I mean, there are good reasons, I guess, that we got where we are. But, um, but I have seen a real deficit in kindness and, and I pray that we will be kinder with one another than we are. Okay, that's the word that I heard. I heard say kind. I'm going to show my nursing background and say that I immediately. I was like, yes, kindness is huge. And yeah. I'm wondering, do you have any advice as healthcare providers? You know, how, what does kindness look like? How can yeah. we improve that? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Uh, I, I, I don't know if there's a single thing that it looks like, but, but I, do think, um, I, I do think it's a trait that we need to work hard to nurture, right? We need to really work hard to nurture. And I think often it is dismissed as being soft or uh, some such thing that it isn't somehow important in care. And, um, and, and I, I think we need to push back on that. You know, it's really, really important and it makes a difference in people's lives. And it is something in us, I think, that we really need to nurture. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I work at it all the time. I'm sure you do too. I'm not imperfect, or excuse me, I, I, I am imperfect in that. I'm not perfect in that. My family would tell you, you know, I can get hangry, so to speak, right? As I often was in Paris, where we've now walked 12 miles, I'm ready to eat. You know, my wife and daughter now have walked by the seventh restaurant or so, you know, tried to figure out where they want to go, and I'm ornery. But I, I, I think it's really I think it's really kind. Um, my colleague Wes Ely um, is a, is a very famous critical care physician, and he wrote a great book which I would commend to you all, and it's called Every Deep Drawn Breath. It's by Putnam, um, published by Putnam about two and a half years ago now, and it really is about how to inject kindness into the care of hospitalized and critically ill patients and. Um, and it's beautiful, and, and I would encourage you to read it. But I do think it starts with us prioritizing that in our own lives um, and working hard to nurture it. Um, I was on, I'm on Twitter a little bit. That's an unkind space, by the way. And um, I was in an article uh, about a week ago on npr.org. I was interviewed, and it was actually a great story, I thought. 
and um, and it went viral. The story uh, didn't have anything to do with me. It was kind of a controversial topic and had a couple million views on on Twitter, and um, and people were so unkind to me, you know, so unkind. And and that's okay. I just wasn't used to it, right? I wasn't used to call it, being called names. I wasn't used to being called a, a grifter and a COVID denier. And I, it wasn't wasn't used to it. And uh, it was a reminder for me of how really vicious people can be. And I don't want to be that way. And I would invite you not to be that way either. And I would invite you to recognize that uh, our kindness to our patients really matters. You know, it's one of the biggest things we can be. Thanks so much, Dr. Jackson, for last night and today as well. Um, we're just thrilled to have you. Yep. Um, so I was thinking about this, this uh, kind of the dialectic of yeah. both acceptance yeah. and advocacy. And yeah. I feel like acceptance, like kindness, can have sort of a, it feels like a soft edge to it, but I actually feel like it's a really powerful intervention to work, you know, when you're doing acceptance and commitment therapy right. interventions. Yes. And advocacy, by contrast, can have... It can feel like it has an angry edge, right. um, but actually, I think is is a kindness that we right. say like you know we want you to both accept, right. and also we're going to fight like hell right. to exactly. make sure that you get what you need yeah. um, in an equitable space. Yeah. And and so how how what have you done to when you're engaging with with individuals with right. long COVID to kind of balance that, encouraging acceptance and and uh, kind of like undying advocacy for people. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is a balancing act for sure, it is. And, um, and I think sometimes in some places when we encourage our patients to do really hard things, the hard things that they need to do if they're going to change, um, they may not experience that in the moment as kind. You know, even though the delivery is gentle and it's thoughtful and, you know, they may not experience that as kind. And um, I think what we have done well uh, and what we've worked hard to do is to build a lot of equity with patients so that they trust us enough that when we say really hard things to them, they'll at least consider those. And, and, and I think we've had good luck at that. Now, sometimes that brick by brick building of rapport with them, building trust, can, it seems to me, take an absurdly long amount of time, right? Like now it's been a year, you know, we've been building trust for a whole year. Um, and, um, and it's not only in the service of um, getting to a moment where I can say a hard thing to you, but now I can finally say a hard thing to you because you finally trust me. And um, before, you might have, uh, you know, put your um, hands over your ears and gone, no, 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 you know, I'm not listening to you. And, and now, because you're aware that I care about you, you're finally going to consider this hard message that I give to you. Um, so it takes a long time. I think advocacy, as you noted, um, is really kind, and um, and and I think it is a balancing act, right? The both and that that we're going to fight. Uh, I, yeah, I wrestled in college for a short time, for a year, um, you know, 35 years ago now, and uh, I had a I had a nickname, Mad Dog, and people <laughs> would bring Beware Dog signs to the to the matches, and. Uh, it was really fun for me, actually. So, so I, I, I do think um, we want to fight like rabid dogs, to use that uh, analogy for our patients, and we want to be kind. And, um, and I think, you know, holding on to that tension, I mean, we don't want to, I don't want to critique Mr. Rogers, I love Mr. Rogers, right? But the, um, the, the sort of notion of Mr. Rogers or, um, or a similar person where kindness is sort of, again, this wasn't Mr. Rogers, but this sort of spineless, hey, how are you? Uh, you know, hope you're doing well. It's lovely to see you today. Um, with, with no meat, uh, you know, that isn't doing anybody any favors. So we need to live in this tension of I'm going to be really kind and I'm going to be really strong in the way that I fight for you. And I do think it's a little bit of a tension. I, I agree with that. I have one more. In your book, you um, quoted Viktor Frankl. So yeah, I'm just right. going to read yes. this because I thought it was so good, and I wanted to hear how you help your patients find meaning. So it says, um, Viktor Frankl said that individuals can endure hugely difficult things 
if they are able to find meaning in them and that they can even be transformed in the process. Right. How do you help your patients move in that direction? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, I mean, I would invite you, if you haven't read the, the short book, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, uh, you know, you should do that. It, it won't take you long and uh, may transform your way of thinking about things in the process. Um, I, I don't think it's quite so simple as reading that quote to people. You know, of course, you would agree. It's not quite as simple as me reading the quote to people, and then them, and and then they say, "Oh my gosh, that's amazing! Now I'm going to find meaning in my suffering." Right? It's incredible. So, um, so I, I I think it takes some time, and I think it takes a lot of. Um, gradual inviting them to even consider that possibility, right? I, I, there's, a, um, there's a pretty robust theory in behavioral change called stages of change theory, right? That some of you are aware of. And, um, and I talk about it a lot and it starts with uh, pre-contemplation, moves to contemplation, moves to action. And if you use something like uh, smoking cigarettes, let's say, and I know this is a tobacco-free campus, but um, but pre-contemplation pre would be, I'm not really thinking about stopping smoking yet, but I'm thinking about the fact that one day I need to think about stopping, right? It's, it's on my mind. I'm thinking that one day I need to think about it. Contemplation, I need to think about it, right? I'm not ready to take action, but now I'm thinking about it. So, um, so moving that frame into this conversation, pre-contemplation, I think, is I'm not really open to the idea currently that there could be some meaning I could derive from my long COVID, but I'm kind of roughly open to the idea that maybe one day I could consider thinking about that, right? That's pre-contemplation. And contemplation would be, you know, in the context of our group, you know, I heard John and Jane and Sue talk about the idea that they are finding meaning in their long COVID struggle, and gosh, maybe I could think about doing that too. That's contemplation, and and I think the the group therapy that we lead is 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 unique and valuable in this way. You know, we have half a dozen groups or so. We have a waiting list of about 150 people who want to get into these support groups. If we wanted to lead them all day every day which I don't, by the way, I, you know, I've got some limits in terms of what I could do. Um, but if we wanted to, I think, we, you know, we could. Um, so the support groups are really useful because um, it's super helpful for somebody struggling to see someone who looks a lot like them, talks a lot like them, sounds a lot like them, has a lived experience like theirs, who has sort of finally got to the place where they can say, as one of our patients did, um, you know, my long COVID isn't healing me, my long COVID, or, or excuse me, my long COVID isn't killing me, it is healing me. You know, there's a patient I'm thinking of named Barbara, um, and, um, and she worked as an executive at a restaurant chain before she got COVID, and, um, and her life was pretty um, out of order, pretty disordered, right? Uh, workaholic, working all the time, priorities that were for her the wrong ones, but the ones she continued to pursue. And uh, she was in the ICU again with COVID and started seeing a psychologist that we refer to who is amazing. And the psychologist said to her, you know, really strongly, really aggressively one day, and it got through to her, you know, stop um, being so nostalgic about this old life you had that was killing you, right? That was not a that was not the life that you really want, that you wanted to get back to. It was killing you. You've got high blood pressure. You've got diabetes, right? You've got 101 problems. That life was killing you. And Barbara paints and she watches birds and, you know, her life is limited in ways that it wasn't before. But, but she would say if she were here, and I wish she were here, um, that she has found some new joys and some new realities um, in her COVID life, and, and that's what we seek to find for these patients. And I think um, that joy, uh, without sounding you know, a little too silly, that joy and that awe and that beauty is there to find, but it starts with people being open to the idea that it's possible. Any final questions? I'll mention one thing. If anybody wants to follow up with me, if, if you have any questions, um, 
uh, if you want to sit in on a support group, as somebody today mentioned, they might want to do, you know, we can make all of that happen. Mm. So um, just reach out to me. You can Google me and, and find me, and i um, glad to keep this going. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Now, that's yeah. very nice, very yeah. nice, very kind. I will say, I'll, I'll tell a really funny story okay. very quickly here. So I, I did a webinar some time ago, and there were maybe 25 people, 30 people on it, 40, maybe 40. And I did say, I said, you know, if, if anybody needs my book and, um, and they can't afford it, I'd, I'd be happy to buy you a copy. And, I, and I, I very much meant that. And then I got an email with like 35 names from people. <laughs> so I'm still I'm working on that. I'm still working on that. Uh, but uh, so if all of you reach out and want to join my support group, might be a challenge to watch. But if a couple of you are thinking of starting a support group and, and you'd like to, to join a time or two, we can make that happen. So uh, thanks for being so winsome and so lovely and so kind to me. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Could you all give him a, a round of applause? We thank you so very much for taking the time to be here. We thank you all so very much for taking the time to be here. Um, um, before, don't leave, we've got other presentations, but I wanna tell you what's on the table are things that you are welcome to take. Um, all of these are wonderful giveaways um, from different parts of our college, and we want, want them to share them with you. The QR code you see on the table is for an evaluation, so please don't leave um, before taking a picture of that and then, then filling out the, um, the uh, evaluation. What else can I tell you? Um, there, we do have books, absolutely. We do have books, um, $30, please, um, write a check or give us exact cash if you have it. Um, um, but Dr. Jackson's book is right there and he'll be here for a few more minutes just to, to sign those if you want. So we are excited. I mean, it's snowing, but it's a great day to be a Bronco. It is always a great day to be a Bronco. So we're excited. Um, the um, Mimic Insurance is helping to sponsor this event. And so please eat a donut and please um, fill out a, a card. I think they have a card for you. They're actually going to raffle off a gift card. And so if your name is in the drawing, that, that's going to happen shortly. So um, we'll start again in, at 1015. We're, all, we're right on time. Do you want to say something? Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
you to Dr. Yvonne Jackson. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Therapy. Um, she earned her doctorate in education with a, special, a specialty in teacher leadership from Walden University. Her academic areas of focus include examination and intervention for pediatric and neuromuscular conditions. She's going to talk with us today um, about improving health equities in our community. So um, I'll just turn it on over to her and you all can ask her questions as we go. Dr. Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. Um, so I found out about this lovely um, tool. It's called Mentimeter. And so if you will, um, take your phones and go to menti.com. I learned this from one of my colleagues. Um, she did, a, we did a virtual presentation and she was using this and I was like, oh man, I love that. Um, and so this is my way to help make this interactive where I'm just not talking to you, but you're going to talk to me as well. So if you go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com and then put in that eight digit code if you can't see it, it's 36130394. And hopefully the internet will be kind to you today. You there? Oh, yep, I see you coming. Yay! So I'm real excited to try this. Um, this is my first time, so if it's a fail, I tried. I'll give you all a few minutes. I think we're halfway there. And it's all anonymous, so I won't see you when you put your answers in. everybody who wants to join in yet anyone need a few more seconds we good uh oh get back here <sighs> okay so we're going to talk about improving health inequities in our community and we do have um, a couple wonderful groups who are doing just that. Um, and so hopefully by the time we're finished with this one hour, we will basically give you a good segue into what they're doing. And that, that's kind of how I plan um, the talk. Maybe it's not moving. Oh, I'm supposed to use this. There we go. So definition. Um, of health inequity and health disparity. Um, sometimes people use it interchangeably, but they're really two different things. Um, and so the health disparity basically is a difference in the inc incidence, prevalence, mortality, burden of disease, and other adverse health conditions that exist among specific populations. That's the disparity. But the inequity is concerns those differences in population health can be traced to unequal economic and social conditions and are systemic and avoidable, thus being inherent, unjust, and unfair, right? And so basically, if we don't do a good job of decreasing the health inequities, we end up with more health disparities, right? But we're going to focus on the inequities today. And so, okay. so here we go. This is the first question to you. What is an example of a health inequity in your mind? So 
type it in and they'll start populating. Access to treatment, um, access to healthy food, which is important. Um, oftentimes, if people are after surgeries, particularly think about physical therapy, to come to physical therapy, if they're not eating well, they're not drinking their water, they're not healing well, and they don't realize that. So that's very important. Um, lack of transportation. Um, I teach health and wellness, and we tell the students, you know, you have to think about, and that's one of our case studies, actually. If a patient, we put two patients together, and one patient can't get to the service or get there on time, instead of not seeing them, ask them why. What, what is the reason that you arrive late? You know, they might have missed the bus or the second bus didn't come on time, right? So they've taken a day off work to get there as best they can. They show up and then you don't see them, right? Um, very important, social economic status, provider bias, even though they think they're not being biased, they are. Um, pain tolerance, everyone has a different pain tolerance. And we can't dictate what your TN feels like and what my TN feels like, right? I have a high tolerance, which is probably not good. Because by the time I'm ready to, for meds, I'm probably waited too long, right? Um, poor access to healthcare, ability to pay or not pay, uh, racial bias, insurance curve, coverage, racism, discrimination, I think I got them all, black maternal medicine, um, breast cancer survival. And one thing that they're doing here in Kalamazoo, which I'm very proud of, is that I believe Bronson, they started um, hiring doulas, right? Um, and so why? What is a doula? What is the purpose of a doula? Anybody? Mm -hmm. your, the system, your dying experience. Mm -hmm. So the doula protects, supports, is an advocate for the mother, right? Because a lot of times, and I'll tell you, I have four children. A lot of times you feel not, ne like, not important during the birthing process. They just want to know if the baby's growing good, um, is the baby healthy, 
you know, how often does a woman is going through postpartum depression and doctor didn't even pick up, pick up on it because they're concerned about the baby, right? All of these are really uh, good things. Thank you, thank you for your participation. Can you help me take this so the screen don't go off so fast? <laughs> she, she probably could figure this out for me. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right. And so I did feel the need because um, Dr. Jackson was talking about, you know, long COVID. Um, there were some iniquities that came about health um, iniquities and or disparities through our COVID um, time. Um, and some of them were um, one that I didn't think about initially. Uh, was the ability to social distance. Um, and so when I first heard about that, I, I was like, oh, wow. It seems like such a simple thing, right, for those of us who lived in individual housing. But what about those who lived in um, apartments, right, where they had to get on an elevator with five, six, seven other people or wait three elevators if there's only one elevator or even a um, commercial elevator in the back, right? And that was one thing that really stood out to me, like, wow, I really never thought about that. Um, housing and other social determinants, um, they just didn't have the ability to social distance. It just wasn't there. Racial narratives and stigma, Dr. Jackson alluded to some of those. Um, access to economic stimulus, right? Um, if they're not in the system, don't have access to put their information in, they might have missed out, right? Or if they were homeless, they might have missed out. Some situations you had to have an address to get services, right? They might have missed out. Um, testing, treatment, and other health outcomes. Um, and the one thing I would say uh, when I think about this, I had, if, I don't know if any of you had um, any close relations to anyone with COVID or tragedy of COVID. And when COVID first started, and I'm going to go, I'm going to digress for one minute, I'm going to come back. Um, a lot of people really didn't believe it was a thing. And then you know, I talked to people who weren't in the healthcare field, and I'm going to say, unfortunately for you, you're going to believe when it affects somebody you love. Right? And I'm, I believe right off the bat, I, I believed, <laughs> but it still made it that much more um, real for me um, when I had two cousins, not one, but two, father and a daughter passed, both. The daughter had asthma and her father had, um, was a survivor of lung cancer of all things. And so what frustrated me is she refused to get the vaccine. And so when she wouldn't get it, he listened to her and he didn't get it. To my recollection or how I feel this happened is she got COVID from work. She was um, worked at Chrysler. I believe she brought it home to him. They both ended up in the hospital and they died within three days apart, right? And so again, I don't know who she got her information from or if she just was an unbeliever. And believe me, I have two kids out of four that do not have, that never got the COVID vaccine. And they're the two oldest. <laughs> 
They're now listening to their mother. Um, and they've been safe. My son has had COVID twice. Thank God he's okay, right? Um, but again, we talk about trials and treatment and believing that um, Pfizer, I believe, that Pfizer is doing a good job of testing. I, I trust and believe that because I'm a researcher. Research has to be done in order for us to do things and get the right treatment that we need, right? Everybody don't believe that. Right? And then the lack of racial ethnic testing data, and we kind of talked about that in the um, other slide. So let's go to, let's go another question. What are the root causes of health inequity? What do you think? So I'm seeing some of the same inequities is actually the, the cause, right? The access, physician bias. Um, someone had to tell me about tacos. Fear, um, lack of engagement with health and human service, inability to see a doctor, right? Racism, bias, prejudice colonialism, systemic racism, false beliefs, lack of concern, laws that support the rich, health insurance design, then we have capitalism and racism, and we got provider bias, medical bias, access, ignorance. Ignorance is kind of probably at the top of the list, right? The lack of knowledge, and we'll address that a little bit later, is an inequity. It's part of the root causes. And so you've given a lot more than I had, but I have racism, sexism, classism, xenophobia, heterosexism, and ableism are some top ones that um, came to mind for me. Thank you for participating. Now we have another one. So people perpetuate these systems at every level right, at every level. Um, it comes from the institutional level, right? People get to where they are by what they know and what they've been doing is work, so why should I change, right? You got interpersonal level, um, us knowing what we, who we are or the bias that we portray, we put that on others, particularly. We could put that on our students, right? Um, we talk about bias all the time, and a lot of times we don't address our own and we all have it, something, some type of bias, every last one of us, right? Is it a good or is it a bad bias, right? And then the internal level. We have to figure out what's not working inside first in order for us to do something about it and to affect the whole, right? So those are three levels, systematic levels. So question for you, what is the impact of having health inequities? What is the impact? What is the, Im what is the impact of us not doing anything about it, maybe, shall I say?
it came in quick. Thank you. One standing out, poor health outcomes, which is very important. Infant mortality, um, and that's dear to my heart, uh, being a pediatric physical therapist and working in the school system with special ed um, children. Um, and um, if you didn't know, Kalamazoo is hovering from third to fourth um, of being the highest percentage of infant mortality rate, um, just to inform you of that. Um, disparities, right, widening the gaps, um, unequal care, economic decline, right? If we, if people are sick, right, they're unable to get to work, they can't make money to pay their bills, right? It becomes a cycle, right? Um, and so I cringe, you know, when I hear people say, um, or, you know, they're just lazy, or they don't want to try, they don't try. You know, we don't know. We don't know the whole story. And even the people begin to talk to you, they don't tell you every single thing, right? They tell you a lot. Sometimes they do tell you too much, oh, too much information. But one thing I do tell my students is that um, all health, First of all, all health professions have to do some level of um, psychology classes, you know. Um, and, and the reason being is because we are going to be given told information all the time, and we need to know how to re react, to not react in a negative way, not be, you know, totally um, surprised by the information that patients give us. Because oftentimes, and I say this specifically as a physical therapist, patients, once they begin to trust us, they will tell us a lot, right? And we have to know when, is, when are we are to listen, and when we are to react, and when we are to assist, right? Because if they tell us things, and they tell us, um, for instance, um, if a patient tells me that she's being abused or domestic violence, probably at that point she's ready to stop being a victim, right? And if I say, oh, I'm sorry, and I don't help her, she's never gonna trust any other health care provider again because she finally stepped out of her comfort zone to tell me and then I do nothing with it, right? So empathy shows up. Um, here, which is so important, and that goes, part of that is the mistrust or the trust, um, which is so important. Talking about the suffering, again, are we listening to our patients, right? Um, they will tell us, again, they will tell us some stuff, <laughs> um, and we have to be ready. Um, I think back to a patient's mother, the, her daughter went away to school, and she develop um, multiple sclerosis. She was in California, and I worked at the time, Detroit Rehabilitation Institute of Michigan, which is right in Detroit Medical Center. And so her mother would bring her um, to therapy. Um, and she had very severe tremors and, you know, couldn't barely get a sentence off because of the tremors. And one day, her mother literally went off on me. She just told me down. And I had to realize that she really wasn't mad at me. She was mad at the system, right? And so I just had to sit down. We just sat down. I don't know how much therapy we got done. And I, and I said, okay, tell me what's going on. What's, what has happened? And tell me what you need. And ironically, I was also the liaison to the Detroit Receiving Hospital um, so I did have some contacts over there. And so we kind of backtracked her because she missed some steps. And the support was back at the in the hospital. And so I was able to get them back connected that way. But initially, when a patient is in, in arms, we, we want to get defensive, and we can't. Um, because we got to realize 
how many levels of frustration are they at by the time they get to you, right? And so we have to know, again, when to just listen, when to react, and when to support. We got to know, right? Um, because the wrong decision can send them away and they will never come back. And we don't want to do that. But thank you for the, these are some good um, generational trauma. That's a good one. That's a whole nother talk for a whole nother day. And long-term illness, definitely. Um, going back to the first one that popped up was death. And you have deaths in there and the mortality rate increases. Right, that's going back to the health disparities. So if we don't address the inequities, we're gonna end up increasing the disparities, kind of what I said from the beginning. So health inequity never negatively impacts everyone, um, whether it's affecting you, um, right, or not. It still affects everyone because, again, if we have so many people not putting into the economy because they're sick and can't work, then things are gonna get worse. That's kind of where we were for a minute, right? Prices rise up, quick as you get a raise, all the prices go up, you don't even really know that you got the raise, right? Right? So it makes it more difficult to contain and treat infectious diseases because if we're not putting the money in, the government is given to other causes and not research, then infectious diseases are not going to get treated properly. Increases the level of crime and violence across communities. Why is that? Why do you think that is? My kid needs the medicine. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna get it, right? Because I love my children, right? Right. And so, when people who are having challenges, right, look at those of us who, in in their mind, appear that we are not having challenges, although we all are in some kind of way. They feel like they get to take some of yours because you have enough, right? Or you have more than enough, right? not knowing how hard it took or what we went through to get what we have, they don't see that. Just like our children, they see that we've gotten uh, you know, a doctorate degree, they don't realize that I cried at night when they were asleep. <laughs> they don't see that part because we cover that from them, right? But we all have challenges, some more than others, right? Some of us are able to work through them, some are not. And so if they don't, they're not getting what they need, just like um, Dr. Dennis said, They'll figure out a way, especially if you're a mother, right? We're going to figure out a way for our kids. Fuels alcohol and substance misuse. Why is that? Yeah, you, think you're numb in the pain. you think you're numb in the pain, right? Right? Sometimes a fifth is cheaper than <laughs> going to the doctor, <laughs> right? You're numb in the pain, thank you. Did you wanna say something else? No, okay. Increased stress and anxiety, right? Because we can't figure out why or how to get through the situation and it increases the stress and anxiety, which causes other problems, right? Sometimes lack of sleep. Some people um, are stressed, they don't eat. That's not my it's challenge. <laughs> You right, but some people don't. They don't. They just don't have the stomach to eat when they're under stress. Um, decreases productivity and employment. Right again. Right. If they're not well, then they don't want to work. If they do go to work, they're not doing a good job. Right. Pushes people into poverty, like we talked about. It's like a cycle. It's like a spiraling cycle. Um, prevents many from getting the health care they need. Right. Um, it costs billions of U.S. dollars and raises the cost of health care, right? Why is it costing so much? Because insurance, I mean, hospitals have to accept people, whether you have insurance or not, right? And they have to get you stable. <clears throat> 
if there are people coming in every day that don't have insurance that they're getting stable, you've seen your hospital bills. They're enormous. And thank God we're just paying a deductible, right? But if it doesn't get paid at all, that's costing us money. That's costing the community money, right, as a whole, right? And so it's best if we can at least get them some insurance if they don't have a job, right? And that's one thing my, my kids are navigating right now is trying to make sure they get a job that provides them with insurance, right? Um, I got one left on the insurance, one more to go. Um, and so, so far so good, but sometimes it's hit or miss. My oldest, she couldn't get on, get on for a while. It was, it was tough that first year she was off my insurance, but she's done it now. But just think if she don't, didn't have me to help her, right? Some people don't have assistance. Um, and again, it's just a spiraling cycle. And I think this is the last question for you all. Maybe, no, that's not a question. How do we address health inequities? I didn't make it a question, I should have. Shout some things out, how do we address it? Single Say it again. Single payer system. Single payer system, okay. Interdisciplinary approaches, systematic change, anything else? Reparations, <laughs> she's, she's on it. Anything else? Education, so important. Mm -hmm. Can we just be nice? <laughs> Can we just be kind, right? And patient, right? A lot of times, I know even for me, I feel like I wait an hour and I rush through 15, 10 minutes, right? Really quickly. Um, one thing I will say, this is a, ta a, a note to Yvonne. He's, I think he said it, Dr. Jackson said it too, is that people know their bodies, right? I have the issue with trying to be a good patient. Right? Do what the doctors say, even though I know my body is telling me. And two times within the last year, I've ended with more extreme treatment or testing that I needed, and it ended up being what I told them I needed in the first place. So guess what? Strike three is not happening. I'm about to be an advocate for myself. I want to be a good patient. I don't try to be a know-it-all, because I'm a physical therapist. I don't know it all, right? But we have to make sure that we are confident, right? And when we're telling a doctor something that we're feeling about ourselves, that we make sure they acknowledge what we're saying, right? And oftentimes, I, we don't, even myself. I'm, I'm, happens to me too, so, but not, strike three is not coming, I, I guarantee you. I'm going to do better. So we've seen this first two, the two in the middle, quite a bit, right? And so basically the reality is, is that everyone has different amounts or whatever that is, right? We talked about equality, giving everybody the same thing is not going to help everyone because some people don't need as much as others. And we're talking about equity, everyone gets what they need, right? So they can all see the over the fence at this point, but justice is what we need to work towards, right? Basically, <clears throat> they say all three can see the game, they've taken the fence away, just take the barrier away. That's where we're at, right? We need to get rid of the barriers that we have right now. So justice, and so I don't know if you've heard it, the new acronym is JEDI. Right, justice, equity, diversity, diversity, and inclusion. So we're adding justice to that piece, right? It's okay of giving me the two containers so I can see, but why do I have to climb up two containers? I'm the shortest one. I need a step stool to get to the second crate, right? So just move the barriers. It's we, we have to get rid of the barriers is where we need to be going. So three, keys I came across um, for improving health inequity. 
um, is we kind of talked about it, is awareness. Part of that awareness is the education, right? So once we increase the awareness of the inequity um, and the role of bias in health disparities, then we could do something about it. And this has to occur, like some of you said, at the systemic level. It has to start from the bottom, right? Or should is that from the top? We have to start deep within the crux of what the problem is, first of all. I mean, then measurement, right? We got to detect and measure healthcare disparities, right? And assess the causes and the impact of health disparities on patient outcomes. We can't just keep talking about it, right? We can't just keep reading about it. We got to make sure we're, we're documenting the numbers so we can sh show the impact that is really happening Right? And then we got to get into action, right? Develop some impactful interventions to address health disparities using data-driven approaches and to improve outcomes and well-being, right? A lot of times we talk about, I guess I talk about, um, like when we talk about teaching health and wellness, right? Health is how you're doing, right? Your blood pressure is this amount, your heart rate is this, your cholesterol is this, that's how you're doing right? But wellness is how you're feeling, right? So I could go to the doctor and get a clean bill of health, but I'm still stressed out. They didn't even dress it with me. They didn't even ask me if I'm under stress or how I'm feeling, you know? It seemed like during COVID, I was getting that nine, seven, nine question questionnaire that was asking me, do I feel safe? You know, am I comfortable at home? Am I good? I haven't gotten that questionnaire in the last year. Personally, I haven't. Right? So how am I doing? Do you, do you really care how I'm doing? Right? And so it's important we have to take it into action. Right? A lot of times, um, again, we talk about going to the doctor again. Like I said, waiting an hour and getting 10 minutes session with the doctor. Um, we don't want to be those individuals. Right? Try to be patient and make sure that you ask, giving your patients the time to just sit and talk and ask you questions. Because if you rush them, then they'll feel like their, their question isn't important. And I laugh, um, I, we talked about, I said this when we were doing one of the book read, um, reads. <laughs> um, I think my daughter was nine, and um, again, I have four kids, so I was all over the place. And she was like, Ma, when we get to the doctor, can you make sure you remember to ask her this? I was like, no, you write it down. Because I might forget. And then I'm going to feel bad because I forgot to ask. And so it was so cute. She had this piece of paper. We were at the end, and the doctor was packing up her stuff. And she said, you have any questions? She looked at me. She said, you have any questions? I said, no, but she does. She pulled. She said, well, she's nine years old. She pulled out this whole list. I think she had like seven or eight questions, right? And I was like, oh, that's a good thing, right? Take some stress off of me. Start empowering your kids young. Um, and then even get to the point with, with the girls. You, you get to the point where, do you want me to go on with you? We, no, I'm good today, right? Empowering them young so that when they become adults who are confident that they can talk to their doctor and make sure their doctor is listening to them. All right, so action is where we need to go. So one way we, are, we can address um, the inequities or the disparities is to talk about the social determinants of health. Um, and this is something, again, we teach in health and wellness. And oftentimes, the students uh, will look at you, and, and I've I actually had at least one say, well, this is really, is not, this is not a part of our scope of practice. And you know, I sit down, cross my leg, and tell me more, <laughs> right? What do you mean, right? Um, again, because if the patient is having all of these issues and challenges, physical therapy is not going to work well if we don't address those challenges. And sometimes we have to stop and address the challenges, right? I do know that we have quotas and um, percentages we are supposed to do, but we have to address so that we can make their session and their um, treatment better recovery, better for them, right? And so we've talked about it, education, access and quality. 
right? Even if, um, so we, to, we know we're supposed to, if we're providing um, information, we know we're supposed to put it at a certain educational level um, and trying to provide those resources for our patients. But sometimes, because if they're having issues, for instance, um, they're illiterate, but they're navigating the world just fine, they don't, they're good, we might want to also say, are you okay um, with this information? Do you need me to go over it with you? You don't necessarily have to read it to them verbatim, but go over the information with them to make sure they're understanding the information that's in the pamphlet or the folder or the postcard, right? Don't just hand um, our patients information and expect them to know. And, and let me just tell you, um, my son, he's teaching, he's, I'm so proud, um, in special ed, and there's a kid, eighth grade, he's a basketball player. And of course, he gets all the accolades, and, you know, because he's a basketball player, he's carrying the team. The young man can't read, right? And my son was like, what, what should I do? I don't know how to address this. I said, well, unfortunately, you gotta start from the beginning, right? And he said he offered him two books, I'm like, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm being very serious. And so when he offered it to the young man, he was like, what do you, what do you he said, pick a book. And he said, like, no, because if I pick one of those kid books, you're going to yell at me, right? And so what I suspect is that this is a generational thing for them. When the, he reached out to the mother, the mother ended up reprimanding the child. Again, what I suspect is that he is not doing a good job of masking the fact that he can't read. You hear what I'm saying? So we gotta go back. Uh, I was at a conference and um, they was, one of the young ladies talked about Ann Arbor um, illiteracy rate is so bad. Um, but, and all they keep doing is passing the kids along. Right? We gotta get back to educating the kids um, and hopefully they can take it home, and if their parents are having challenges, they can say, look, Ma, let's read through this. And they'll want to learn. And like I told my son, if he, sh if he sees that you really care, just take him to the side by his soul. And once he starts to see words that he recognizes, then he's going to start picking up a book on his own. But you got to start from the beginning. So education is so important. Healthcare access, and then once they get access, there is quality that they're not treated because of the type of insurance that they have, right? We want to make sure everyone is treated the same. Doesn't matter, right? If mine's only going to cover $30 and yours is covering 100 I still should get the same treatment. But we want to make sure they have access, right? Um, if they don't have insurance, they're not going to uh, go seek out the care, right? Um, neighborhood and built environments, um, we, we talked about this in um, our racial justice committee. I happen to be on the um, environment committee. It, it focused on the campus, but um, it just reminded me of some things we take for granted, right? Just because an area is um, handicap accessible, <clears throat> it still might, might be accessible for every person, right? Depending on what their, their challenge is. And so looking at their environment and not just saying, oh, this is done, it was done years ago. No, maybe we need to make some changes, right? <clears throat> social and community, um, the social and community context is important. Um, a big part of health and wellness is our social beings, right? And if we're always secluded and by ourselves, that's a part of us that we're not uh, fulfilling, believe it or not. We are social beings, right? Um, even if you consider yourself an introvert or a loner, which I do kind of consider myself, I love my people. I just got a time that I want to be cut off from you all, <laughs> right? I could be with you all day. Once 8 o'clock hit, I, I just need me. And that's fine, right? But we are social beings. And so people don't have the ability to, to do that. Um, that's not helping with their well-being. And then, of course, the economic stability is so important. We have to improve. Um, economic stability across the board. So one way uh, we need to consider 
Um, going back, and some of you said that the systemic causes, what are the systemic causes of these health inequities? Um, the fundamental causes of the social inequities that lead to poor health, right? That goes over into the community. I'm talking about the social determinants of health. Um, underlying social, see social keeps popping up in economic conditions um, that influence people's ability to be healthy, right? A lot of times um, when, when you are in situations or you're talking about um, certain things to improve, you know, oftentimes you'll hear people say, oh, I could never do that. Oh, I can't do that. I would never be able to do that, right? Um, and I always think um, sometimes for myself, well, if you're, you, in order for you to live, you need to make the change, right? Or your life depends on you making the change, right? And a lot of people don't believe it, uh, but it is a true thing, right? Um, we have to, and I'm just talking to you all as individuals, as helpers of people who your job, your profession is to help others, is that you have to spend time taking care of yourself and your well-being first. And Dr. Jackson alluded to this, right? If we are not well, how can we do a good job of taking care of others, right? And we have to be, have the ability um, to leave those conversations, I always say at the door. Um, when I was working um, in the clinic or the school, I would often get to work and sit in the car for a minute and just take a deep breath. Because like I said, I have four kids, so it was a lot. Just getting all four to school, it was a lot. And so I would just get to work and I would just pause to stop the car and I would just take a deep breath. Because in my mind, I, I had to release that morning with the kids and get it out, out of my head so that I could go and work and be the best physical therapist that I knew how to be, right? And the same thing when I leave work. Once I leave, leave out the door, I, I visualize, I'm a visual person, leaving it, like taking the cape off and leaving it at the door, right? Because if we do not take care of ourselves in the midst of taking care of everyone else, then we're not going to be any good to anyone else, right? So that's just really a, a um, an important part of that. And then our social needs, and I was talking about that. A lot of times, again, we, we forget we need to have that social interaction. We need it. It's a part of it. And a lot of people can't get it. Um, if you're out um, homeless, you're carrying your bag around and your suitcase, carrying your life in your suitcase, you, you don't want to talk to people because you don't trust them. You don't know if they're going to try to take what little you have. Right? And so that social part gets diminished because they don't, you, they don't, they're afraid, right? They need to protect their stuff. Um, and so I don't, I've never seen a bunch of homeless people having a party in the park, right? They're usually in their silos to protect their stuff. And so that's important. That's an important piece that we're, that they're not getting, right? Do you all have any comments, questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so actually, <laughs> I don't know if it'll work. So, um, one thing I've been considering is, again, is providing the information, right? Going, basically, s similar to street medicine, taking the medicine to the street. I want to take the knowledge to the street. And so, one thing I've been um, pondering on how to do this is, so for instance, when you have... Um, the art festival or the, what is the other one? It's called a, um, like a um, yard art harp or like they have the, the uh, I'm drawing a blank, downtown, they have, say it again? Not party, but when people basically have used items, what is that called? 
it's kind of like a citywide garage sale downtown. What? Say it again. Like the flea market, but it's in this. Yeah, it's down. Me and my daughter, me and my daughter, her friend, gone a couple of times. And so going to things like that and just providing either postcards or pamphlets to give, but it has to be appropriately written so that they can understand it. And that's one thing I really been literally this week I've been pondering: how can we let them know that there are resources for them and where to go to get the resources? And, and assure them that when they get there, they're going to get what they need. Because if we get them to trust us and we say, hey, we got these resources for you, and if they go to try to access the resource and they're shunned or not giving the support that we told them that they would get, then there's that mistrust again, right? Um, and so kind of that's what I've been pondering literally this week, um, how to get um, – some resources to uh, so that we can offer those out. That's one thing I've been pondering this week, literally. Thank you for the question. Any other comments? Anything that you've been doing that we could collaborate with and do better? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. 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 Right. Does anyone wanna is that you? I <laughs> you're just on a roll today. I don't even know how to it just feels like your soul is dying when like yeah, okay. I mean we're all interconnected and mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed now that No, don't, don't be. What'd you say? Collective soul, yeah, that we end it together positively or not, right? Thank you for the question. Anything else? I think that's my last, let me double check. That's my last slide. Make sure. Yes, it is. Thank you all. Thank you so very much. We have a gift for you, but I left it in the back of the room. So it'll take me a few minutes to get back there and get it. But thank you so very much for taking the time and, and sharing with us. And it's my hope that through these presentations, um, we're taking away ways that we can make a difference and make our community better. So thank you, Charles. I appreciate you. <laughs> um, so. Um, we do have a drawing. The um, gentleman from Mimic is going to come in, and we'll do that drawing, and then we'll start again at 11.30 once I know if my presenters are here for the, the community panel. Okay?
started in a few seconds. Um, so, I, but before we get started, I wanted you all to know, um, uh, well, I wanted to thank you again for coming and, and spending the morning with us. There is a QR code on your table that leads to the evaluation for today. Please um, take some time and give us your thoughts. Um, what I'm really interested in, I'm very, very interested in, what you want us to bring. Um, we're always looking at health disparities. Um, if you have guests or speakers or, or topics that you want us to address, please don't hesitate to put that into the evaluation. What you see on the table are just giveaways, which means we want to give them away, and we want you to take them with you. So um, Charles is also putting some food out so that you all can have a, a little snack um, as, as we wrap up the day. So feel free, eat a, you know, you had donuts, I know. I know you already had donuts, and I know these are other snacks, and yes, this is the College of Health and Human Services, but we expect you to take the stairs. I don't know what to take. <laughs> right, because we, we went to Costco. Well, that's all I can tell you. Um, so, so I'm going to go ahead. I know it's 1128, um, but I'm going to go ahead and at least get us moving, and so that... Um, the, the snow looks like it's over and, and it'll be fine for now. Uh, I think, I want to thank Teresa, um, Teresa Meredith, Mayor Watkins. Mayor Watkins. She came all the way you are from Lansing in the snow. And so I just thank you. That was kind. That was very nice. Um, Matthew, may I introduce you? Sure. Okay. So you're going to sit right here? You're going to sit right there? <laughs> no, well, we want to be able to see you. We want to be able to see you. And so this is Matthew Fox, and he is representing Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. So thank you so much for coming. Of course. Your gift is right there. Thank you. And then this is Carolyn Watley, and she's representing the Family Health Center. So I will, um, you all do a better job of introducing yourselves than I will. So let, let's start off with some questions. And the first question, of course, is um, introduce yourself, your agency, give us some background, okay? Go ahead. All right, my name is Matthew Fox. I'm the program supervisor of the, I, I do have a mic, but, um, yeah, I can Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. So my name is Matthew I'm the program supervisor of the Whole Health Initiative at Integrated Services of Kalamazoo. And so we are a program that is kind of aimed on holistic health of the mind, body, spirit. And so our program is a little different from regular case management services um, for the simple fact that we try to cater to people with chronic medical conditions. And when we're looking at people with mental illness, a very, very high percentage of um, our clients also have chronic medical conditions along with their mental health issues. And so on our, on our team, we have uh, five case managers. We have a nurse that coordinates all our care. We have an amazing collaboration with Family Health Center where we work with uh, one provider on Tuesday afternoons and she kind of sees probably about 85 to 90 percent of our clients and so before she sees our clients, our nurses over there kind of meeting with um, the primary care doctor before they come in to give updates on their mental health issues, um, their diagnosis, medications, current things that they're kind of struggling with and so we're trying to kind of create that whole continuum of care with them. Um, also on our team, we have a nutritionist that works with our clients. Um, she has office visits, she goes to people's houses, looks in their fridge and their cupboards, helps them kind of do meal preparations. She goes to uh, Myers or whatever the store of their preferences and kind of looking at, you know, healthy op op or options, um, nutrition pieces of that. And another part of our program is we have an, our InShape program. And so anyone in our program that has a BMI of over 25 
and also fits the criteria of mental health, which is schizophrenia, bipolar, major depressive disorder, and I'm not sure if I'm losing one, but we have our amazing mental health, or health mentor over here, Charles, and so we have a great collaboration with uh, the Kalamazoo Athletic Club, and so anyone that fits the criteria for in shape, um, the clients get a year membership, free membership to the Kalamazoo Athletic Club. They also are able to meet with our health mentor twice a month um, just to help them kind of coordinate between their physical health, the nutrition, their psychiatric health, and their um, mental health issues. And so. Well, exciting, because Charles is the graduate assistant for the DEI. I almost didn't recognize him, because I usually see him right. in his workout, you know, <laughs> attire, but... Oh, that's great, yeah. that's great. And go ahead, Carol. So, um, hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn Watley. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Vice President of Clinical Affairs at the Family Health Center. And actually, this is my almost third year anniversary so I'm excited. Um, at Family Health Center, we are the safety net hosp um, clinic in um, the community. We were there for all the patients who are not able to access care in, in anywhere else. We provide um, just regular primary care, behavioral health, and dental care. And um, I, I see him every week almost <laughs> when I do my clinical work. We're, um, and see what an awesome job they're doing, seeking the patients who are not able, you know, who don't make their medical appointments. So we really are there to provide the continuum of care for our patients, to engage our patients in their health. And I think this is, you know, as we talk later of some of the challenges, it's really having, um, I think our patients look, I think one of our challenges is that patients look, look at us as more of an urgent care. So they drop in frequently um, for, things that are cute, but what we really want is to have people engage into that whole episode of care and really work on all the preventative things we know that are so essential to, um, to good health. To, uh, we have a, a robust dental um, operation, and tomorrow it's our dental day of caring. Mm -hmm. It's the day that um, not only our providers, but volunteers from the community come and bring their time. This was formed by one of our previous dental officers a few years ago. I think it's 2019 was the first one. And unfortunately, um, she passed away. But this is, and we have they've kept this going. Oh, this good. tomorrow, I think, will be one of our biggest yet. We have about 50 students from University of Michigan, mm -hmm. dental students, wow. plus uh, um, a huge number of dental uh, dentists from the community. And this is where anyone, pe many people have pre-registered, but if anyone, I'm just, just if anyone they've not registered, we also take walk-ins. They have about 500 people registered. Wow. We know this population, about 50% will show up, uh, depending on the day. But um, we, so we have openings for um, anyone, uh, you know, dental health is one area where even if patients are able to access medical care, accessing dental care is always a, a struggle. So there'll be hygienists there to do cleanings yeah. and, you know, a root canal and wisdom teeth extraction. Wow. So if you know anyone who needs to access dental care, this is a plug for um, tomorrow or dental day care, and we'll be there from eight to eight. Wow. So. Which, which is incredible because 15 years ago, there was, some odd, there, there was very limited dental care in Kalamazoo, and we used to have to take clients out to Augusta, Three Rivers, just for simple dental care. Um, I think we had one person that took Medicaid who was on Westnage, and he closed down. And so the introduction to that to our community was just absolutely amazing for the dental clinic. So appreciate you guys. Yeah, we do, and I'll have a personal question, but I'm, I'm going to go through my list. And you all are welcome to stop me um, and interject and ask a question as you see fit, because I have some, but um, certainly there, there may be others. And, um, and feel free to, to um, tell us what you, like, like the dental, tell us what we need to know so that we can be better advocates for our students, for example, um, and, and others in the community, okay? So my first question. <laughs> what issues most affect health 
in our community from your agency's perspective? I think that the social determinants of health that we, that we know about, it's the challenges as we talk about where people are accustomed to that going to access care only when they need it and not recognizing the importance of that preventative health. So there, I think Kalamazoo as a community, we have a lot of resources, but the education around what resources are available. Uh, just to touch on dental, for instance, there's so many patients who show up and until recently, until this year, I think, Medicaid did not pay for the preventative care. And now that preventative care is available, people are not accustomed to going for regular cleanings, which we know is so essential because our dental health, not only our dentition and the cosmetic uh, effect, but all the other effects that, that, that kind of trickle down from that. So again, many people come in, ST, STI testing, Kalamazoo is about the second highest in the state. There's a lot of transference of um, sexual transmitted infections. But that education and early testing so, and having people come and access those things, I think, is a huge opportunity and a challenge. And not only the, the, the obvious, the food insecurity, the, um, the, the unhoused, you know, but even patients who are, are in situations where they have more access to, to um, like Medicaid, they're not really accessing all of those preventative things that are available. I think the one thing that you mentioned earlier was the walk-ins. I think the walk-ins have been a game changer in this town, um, not only for Family Health Center, but for our agency, is that when people are in need, they're in need immediately. And when they're coming into places and they're saying, well, we can schedule you two weeks out, um, you'll meet with someone at this time, you know, that time frame is what we're realizing when that was happening, that follow through with people for appointments was, I mean, we're, we're cutting those things drastically. And so with the walk-ins at Family Health Center where they're able to come in and actually see a physician that day, for our agency, we just opened up our new um, emergency access center. And so anyone coming in can come straight in, they will meet with someone, they will get a full assessment um, to look at their needs, and and have an appointment, and then they will kind of determine what level of care or what services are available for them, and then immediately make that appointment. So initially, they're not coming in, and they'll say, okay, we'll see you in two weeks, come back. They're actually getting that service where we can build that rapport and hopefully make um, that continuation care even better. Um, I think the other part is, is when we're looking at what our clients are recovering from in terms of psychiatrically, spiritually is the recovering from learned helplessness the recovering from learned hopelessness the recovering from bad treatment that they've received in the past the recovering from trauma the recovering from stigma and so when we're putting this into place we understand that they are very hesitant to come in due to what has happened to them in the past and also they did to be able to advocate for themselves is, is they know something's wrong, but they don't have someone to guide them through that. And I know in my experience, it's like I, I want to go into the doctor and I have this whole list of stuff that I want to talk to them about. I get in, the doctor starts talking, and it's like almost Charlie Brown. You don't, you're not listening, because like, and you're like, uh-huh, 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 and they're like, anything else? Nope. And then you leave, and you're like, they didn't address anything, and now it, it's like I tried before, I, I wasn't able to get my help, so I'm not going to you know, go back. So having that kind of advocacy, having that help, having people walk them through these systems, but also learning about, so at different doctor's offices, I remember about, about 15 years ago, they had this whole panel and they're discussing how do we do continuum of care? And so they had psychiatrists, they had doctors, they had social workers, they had all sorts of people in the community of how can we kind of develop that we're all talking together and working for the benefits of the clients. And I think what, one of the doctors, the, the hardest part, what they were saying was is because of how things are structured, they have very limited time 
with the clients, they can only see or address really one or two issues and you know, then they have the follow-up appointment. So I think that's one of the challenges also that we're, we're kind of facing is those constrictions in terms of what they're able to do, so. So I have a question for both Dr. Watley and, and Matt. Can you talk about some of the strategies that you found to be effective at kind of like moving the structure from going to the ER or going to urgent care or accessing care only when you have an emergent or urgent issue to encouraging folks to consider preventative care, to consider early intervention care, to consider that whole health care, and to receive that? Like, how do you set up the structure so that folks are more willing to engage? So, um I think with the older population, with people who have chronic diseases, it's easier. I was just in a conversation with, um, you know, the Medicaid providers in the in the in the state, and one of the challenges is the access. It's having people who don't feel ill come in for care, which really for adults is that 20 to 64 year old, and then a lot of adolescents. It's so it's for one of the main strategies is education. First, educating the providers. So they understand their role in, in, their role in it is to really engage the patients, right? We have to educate our patients. We have to go an extra step to really show people the importance of coming. If I have high blood pressure but I feel fine, I might, this is not something that will give me consequence today. It will give me consequences from years of not addressing it correctly. So we have quality metrics that we follow, quality initiatives around some of these chronic conditions to incentivize not only the providers, but also to have them engage with patients. And we discuss strategies on how we bring them to the table. I think a big issue, as well, uh, one of the real challenges for us, though, is understanding what do the patients want, right? We have community health workers and we've expanded our team, and so they can spend some of that time really doing that additional work. We understand the providers have limited time, but who else in the team has the time to really spend a time and kind of engage? So I think we do a decent job with the patients who actually show up. The real opportunity is the people who don't come at all, right? The ones who show up, you can engage in them. So how do we, how do we have the people who don't have who who don't see the importance of coming at all how do we how do we engage mothers and fathers or parents and guardians to bring their children in for those well child visits which we know are so important right and what would incentivize them we think of we think of incentives for the for the patients but again as we talk about a lot of these things have to be pretty immediate for people to react to it And also, I'd, kind of when we're looking at the hierarchy of needs for our clients, I think one of the challenges that we have is, is we'll, we'll have the appointments scheduled with the clients, and we'll call and say, hey, we're on our way to pick them up. And they said, I cannot go because I have to deal with this, 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 this. this. And so a lot of times their health kind of goes down kind of the hierarchy because they don't have housing. They're dealing with trauma. They're dealing with, where am I going to get my next meal? Um, whether there is chaos you know in their lives is is helping them understand that this is part of that whole you know piece but i think like you said is is developing that rapport once we get them is to know for them to say hey there's someone that's listening to me there's someone that's helping me to guide me the community health workers are amazing on that kind of right up front working with them is helping them maneuver these types of things. Writing down, what right now, what are the top three things that are preventing you from being successful? And then, you know, helping them get the things out of their minds, onto paper, developing that kind of structured, how do we go from here and make these things work? And I think the first time something does work, they're more apt to do it again. If they went, they got their need met, someone listened to them, oh, let me try it on this end too. So again, I think that rapport piece is huge. So in our conversation this morning, we've been talking about bias. We've been talking about um, um, inequities, um, disparities. We've been talking about social injustice. How, how does your agencies um, 
deal with that coming from the agency's perspective, but understanding the, the um, patient, the potential patient's perspective as well? Well, I talk about education and training for the providers uh, because a lot of times the providers might be the one step distant. Having a lot of, um, a lot of like the support staff really are people from the community. But I think unless we really have that dialogue for people to recognize and train them in recognizing their own biases, right? It's, it's important that we have the conversation. It's for important for people. And then to deal with incidents. Things, pay, pay, having a way that patients can report if they feel they've been treated unfairly, having honest conversations and giving back that feedback to people. So I think it's, we, we, we you know, that, that's work that has to be, you know, ongoing. And I think then when things work well and patients feel listened to, that I felt someone treated me some way and I, and, and it was acknowledged, right? So that, um, it will help them to, to feel more seen. But I think definitely representation at seeing people who look like you, who people can, who you feel you can relate to, you know, for a substance use um, clinic, there's, you know, we have a, a recovery coach. So, you know, they, have, they, they understand your particular challenges around um, substance use. I think that, that that is an important piece as well. Um. I, I guess overcoming that powerlessness piece that our clients are experiencing is helping them find their voice, helping them express themselves in ways that can be effective to them. So understanding where they're coming from is, is hopefully we can help them some other options, but also being there very close with them. Um, I remember, because I, I used to work with uh, drug courts and sobriety courts and things like that, and the judges and the case managers were always like, well, they got a year, so we got to guarantee that they're never going to use and they're never going to commit crimes, you know, after this year, and why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing that? And I think one of the biggest things that has entered mental health in the last decade or two is that acknowledge of trauma-informed care. And I think if that education at every level of where we're dealing with people to understand the behaviors, understand where they're coming from, that this is not malicious, this is not, in, and this is the, the stigmas is, is people say that they're antisocial, that they're, you know, all of these negative connotations and this is ground zero trauma that they are experiencing that is preventing them from getting services because they come in, they don't know how to advocate. They'll come in, they'll start yelling, and then they say, you can never come back. And now, again, it's back to those, no one's going to help me, and that cycle kind of continues. So. Oh, you have a question? Would you? Sorry. Hi. Uh, so I had a question about, like, um, do you guys do anything like following lead exposure? Um, and I only bring that up because a couple years, oh God, four years ago now, I did an internship with Head Start in Kalamazoo through KRISA, and that was one thing that we looked at with children um, in Head Start. We were looking at um, hemoglobin, vision, hearing, and then lead levels, and I had learned that um, in Kalamazoo there was like um, a, pr a very high level of lead found in children and we know we talk about that a lot with the flint water crisis and how that those that that exposure to lead at a young age or really at any age leads to like a lot of difficulties later in life um, i was just wondering is that an outcome that you guys look at at all it is one of the quality measures that we look at i think uh a part of that is making the process we recently changed to get more immediate testing. Again, with our population, any, a lot of things, anything that you can get, that you can get people results and implement things, treatment that needs to be done at that time, at that point of care, is, is more valuable. I think adding to you know, that assessment is, is 
how, and I think, again, one of these challenges is there is a myriad of things that can affect a person now. And I think there's quite a few things that are kind of undiagnosed or unasked in terms of fetal alcohol syndrome. I mean, how many times do we do any assessment for that for our clients? Traumatic brain injuries. I, I think the more thorough in terms of those assessments, we can maybe weed some of those things out to say, okay, let's rule out this, let's rule out that. The unfortunate part is that time factor. There's so many things, and I think when people are filling out a lot of those things, they don't kind of recognize it. And I see the same thing with assessments when we ask people, have you experienced trauma in your life? A lot of people say no, because they don't understand what trauma is and how that's truly affected them. And that's when kind of building that rapport. Um, I know with assessments, they come in and people ask like 50,000 questions and clients get lost in those assessments. A lot of times for me, I start with just one question. Right now, what is preventing you from being successful? And if they could start that, that easier dialogue, then you can start doing that timeline. Then you can start moving back. But again, the lead one, that's hard because, I mean, how would they know? We have houses that are hundreds of years old and that are unkept, and people are living in a lot of these conditions that have long-term effects that unless that's immediately tied to something that they're being treated for, we don't know. And I guess I can't, I can't stress the importance of having, having people understand the importance, because we would, you, you can't be tested if you don't come, right? The importance of bringing um, the, the children to appointments so that they can have the appropriate testing at the appropriate time. I'm gonna change gears just a little bit. We were, you were talking about voices and, and making sure people have a voice. And so um, I want to first ask you, who do you think makes the decisions about health in our community, in Kalamazoo com community, co county? Who, who makes the decisions about health, health care? Well, I'm, I'm making the policies or how yeah. yeah. Well, I would think a lot of that would come from the state at the state level. So then I will ask this. How do we how do you feel from your agency's perspective? How can we get those voices who are missing to the table? I, I guess when, when we're looking at, because we have quite a few clients that, you know, like, would you like to set up a primary care physician? And they're like, I only go to the, I don't go to a primary care physician. If I need something, I'll go straight to the emergency room. And so I, I think, A, some of the community outreach that has been implemented in Kalamazoo is trying to locate those underserved populations. Um, just letting them know what those kind of services are, having that coordination with the ERs, if they're having frequent flyers of people that are coming in, what are, what are we trying to aim at, and linking them to services. Because a lot of, I think a huge thing, um, a challenge for people is the transportation piece and that advocacy piece. And so if we can have someone coming in and, and they may have a myriad of appointments of specialists that they just, they can't keep track of those things. And so if we can get that earlier on, identify where kind of the, um, where we're trying to find them and how do we make that link and how do we make that sustainable? It just got me thinking a little bit like about how do we how do we get the people who who were making decisions for to the table so is there any way at either of your agency that you I mean maybe beyond the the customer survey that you get people that are receiving your services to the table like and have their their voices be heard on what they want and need in a provider or in a um, healthcare agency 
I think that's a necessary piece um, and an opportunity for us to dialogue more, understand more what, what they need. Because it, you know, around customer service, yes, um, but I think we could do a better job at really understanding the pa from the patient perspective some of those specifics. I think consumer advisory boards are, are huge, is having that representation of your clientele that is coming together, meeting with the people that are making those decisions, is to say, okay, here's what you guys are doing, right here are some of the discrepancies, here are some of the challenges that us as consumers are facing in being able to meet together to kind of bridge that gap. I think. Um, Peer supports and things like that is the introduction to peers in the system has just been a game changer across the board of having you know the recovery institute the community health workers and things like that where clients are meeting with people that they can um, relate to and to talk to and to have that as you know their voice also for them to help them how did you get to this place and then in sharing those stories i think it's hard for them to do that because they may feel kind of threatened or the powerlessness against you know professionals is to have someone that is on their level that understands that's been there to help them to say hey collectively we can change the system because even we, I think, feel powerless because there's a lot of things coming down from above us, but you know, if we can get from that bottom part is, what is the most important? Because our clients are part of the treatment team. The, you know, we aren't the treatment team providing the treatment. They are part of that, and I think a lot of times we lose sight because I think we get to this point where, and, and I don't think we do that maliciously, that Obviously, they don't know what they're doing. They need someone to tell them what they're doing. No, not at all. We need that kind of collaboration. And we do have represent, like on, on the level of how we make decisions, our board is 51%. Uh, you know, they, we, we do have the makeup of consumers on the board itself, members from the community. But if we're just talking like an individual patient level, um, and our providers, uh, many people who work in the space, because I said a lot of the, a lot of our clinical support staff, a lot of our staff in general, they they're also another avenue that brings things forward and and kind of guide how we direct what we're doing and focusing on because we can. There's so much to focus on, but that also people can bring things forward on those levels. If they know, you know, I've noticed X amount of patients. These are some of the things we're doing. I've noticed people coming, so this is also, I think, um, based on the running out of battery. <laughs> Some of, I think we have, uh, we have a collaboration with Loaves and Fishes that will happen from the summer where we'll be one of the donation sites. And that's because of a lot of the providers um, and just staff in general coming forward with understanding the, um, you know, the, some of the food insecurities that patients are dealing with. Oh, you had a question. So I just also wanted to add when Dr. Dennis talked about like who's making the decisions, I also think that we all got to acknowledge like we're part of that system, right? Like in part, like I feel a responsibility because I have some positional authority and because I'm a researcher and a faculty member and administrator. So in part, like I'm making some of the decisions and so to, and to Dr. Watley's point, like that's why representation matters, right? That we, we've got representation from, from all folks. And I, I just want to raise up Family Health Center and Integrated Services of Kalamazoo specifically, because you'll notice when Dr. Watley's talking about the, the dental care program that that's offered for free on a Saturday. And that's by intention. And that part of the reason why people go to the ER is because their doctor's office isn't open. So you'll note that Family Health Center is open on expanded hours, right? It's one of the FQHC responsibilities. And with Integrated Services at Kalamazoo, when Matt's talking about that, that Charles is the health coach, that's not taking place at a community mental health building or even at a clinical setting. That's taking place at a gym because that's where people work out. <laughs> Right. And, uh, and it's taken place at libraries and it's taken place in collaboration with peer support specialists and recovery coaches. So I think that Integrated Services of Kalamazoo and Family Health Center are both examples of recognizing that 
representation, that opportunity for voice, and also that it's an evolutionary process. Like when we know better, we do better, and we have an obligation to do that. So um, I always look to those two organizations as some of the leaders, and I think it's really a privilege in Kalamazoo to have two such organizations who really take that decision, you know, giving back the decision-making power to the people who are receiving services very seriously. And, uh, and so like it's, you know, the 51% of the board, board of directors are recipients of services. That's, that's an intentional choice to disrupt traditional power structures and to empower people to be in charge of their own whole health services. So, so thanks so much for, for, le for leading the way um, at Family Health Center and Integrated Services at Kalamazoo. We're hoping to be a small part of that in the College of Health and Human Services, clearly. And I think that the, the outreach piece is huge because to be able to go to them instead of them coming to us is as we realize they don't come to us until it's too late. You know, they don't come to, you know, the ER until it's too late. And so if we can do some of those preventative um, measures, having our staff be visible at the drop-in center, working with the mission, um, going to the, you know, the homeless shelters and things like that, is I think the more that we are visible, we might be able to engage them, which, again, until it's too late, so. So I'm going to integrate... Um in your bag, in your bag, you have the book that we've been reading. It's, I'm, I'm using this oh, yeah, quick. Sorry. I'm going to use this. Um, called Clearing the Fog by Dr. James Jackson. And one of the things that um, we've been talking about these last couple of days is chronic illnesses. We've been talking about long COVID. Can you all talk about what your services um, for people with chronic illness, long COVID, what types of services are available so that if we need to, we can refer? So I think initially it's just having that good evaluation of what's going on with them. And I think a lot of times when they, when they come into our agency or come into Family Health Center is we're, we're, we're trying to narrow down and rule out what is going on. But with that takes additional appointments it takes additional follow-through whether they need to go get you know blood work you know follow up with a specialist I think sometimes that's where that disconnect you know comes and in I kind of go back to helping people remember appointments where are they going what medications they're on are we problem solving with them how to get to these different places can they use medical transport is things so hard for them that they may need case management services if they may need that kind of extra service um, because it is a lot especially when you're looking at chronic health is it's not a I come in I have an appointment they prescribe meds for me it might be a referral to a pulmonologist it might be an endocrinologist all of these different things which a lot of times for our clients can be very overwhelming, but if they know someone is there helping them navigate through those things, we might be able to address those long-term conditions. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really that identification of who or what's going on with the patient. So we've got to see and evaluate, diagnose, because we have a lot of resources that are available. It may, for some of the specialists, it may take longer for them to see a specialist, but I think we're lucky we are in a community that has resources be, and collaboration with not just Integrated Service of Kalamazoo for Mental Health, for people who may be too sick for us to see. Then, it, you know, we've got collaboration with Bronson and their specialists with Borg, uh, Ascension Borges. So I think we are lucky that we have that and I think the more we collaborate as as a team, uh, if we're all looking at how, how we best benefit or the, the community that we serve, that's where we can kind of do some of these exact things. Think of strategies because a lot of times you might not know there's an issue, right? If we're looking at it just on a narrow way, a vision, but then if we look at it more expand in an expanded strategic, we can probably, we can definitely bring more solutions to the table. Mm -hmm. I think with the 
advent of um, electronic records, the more that that is being useful is, is that we can go in and see, you know, the, the, the different appointments. We can see within Epic, you know, what they've seen um, with pulmonologists where their primary care doctor, back in the day you had to wait for phone calls or paper. Now it's kind of that instantaneous thing where we can then start developing those plans and those follow throughs with them. Um, when people are discharged from the ER, I know for every client in Integrated Services at Kalamazoo, we get a notification if any of our clients have been in the ER or the hospital, which gives us a chance to then call them right away to have that follow-up. Do, do we need to schedule something with your primary care physician? We see that this happened for that follow-up because they, get just, they just get lost in the confusion. So, so tell me, why for you two personally and for your agency, why does healthcare disparities matter to you? We're humans taking care of humans. Um, I, I think when we look at it, the disparities is, is why does this person get this and this person doesn't? You know, what are the factors behind that? What is going on in these people's lives? What are all these different pieces that are preventing barriers for, for them getting the help that they need? And how are we breaking down those barriers for them? Yeah, I think for me personally is feeling that, you know, I, I have been lucky, blessed, or however, to, to do the work that I do, and therefore I have a charge that I should do better for others. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, I came from, I'm originally from Guyana, so I was born there. I moved here when I was 20. But we had national health care, so mm -hmm. not that I'm saying national health care is the, is the answer, but what I'm saying that I got vaccinated in schools, right? And so there are so many things that happen that I took for granted as a child, and I, and we're here where there's a, there's a huge disparity with those who have and can afford and those who don't. Bringing your children to usual follow-up visits for me when I took them to private pediatricians was not even a question. And, and we have children who don't follow up regularly, even though there's, you know, because of all the other things that are going on in their lives, and therefore we have a charge to to be more, to be very intentional. A lot of times we do things because of what surrounds us and we feel we're special because we do them. But if you think, you know, when you think about it, it's because I may not have all that chaos in my life, right? And at the end of it, we're just, as he said, humans taking care of humans and we should do the best job that we can. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. And I just want to add that, sure. you know, once, once you're, you're in that community, you are seeing the most beautiful, creative, intelligent, mm. perspired, I mean, resilient. It, it, it's just amazing when you're working with them and then you hear their stories and you're like, you ask yourself, how do you get up each day? You know, how do you do it? But you see they do it which then just propels you even more that if anything's possible, so. Um, what do you consider the call to action for the health establishment as well as citizens of our community to improve our health outcomes in Kalamazoo and our state? I think the, one of the calls to healthcare, I think, is just the overabundance. I mean, I don't know if anyone's been in the Bronson ER lately, but any time of day, any day of the week, it is packed. And people are sitting there for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, and they're trying to triage them. And you have all these costs associated with these pieces that if that call to action was those preventative measures, and this is why people feel that they don't get go and get the help that they need 
because this is what I have to go through. These are all those hurdles that I have to go through. This is the inaccessibility. They're not going to listen to me. I don't have the funding. I don't have the transportation. And if, so if we can break that down of more of that preventative, more of that, let's use our community resources until things are too late, I think that would be a, very helpful across the board. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's more collaboration as we talk, utilization of the ED as we look at healthcare resources as a whole. And it being more than just talk when people say, okay, you, how can I help you? Mm -hmm. And then if you have patients or people that you say, oh, I think Dr. Watley may be able to help in this area. I think we need more communication at this level mm -hmm. as we think about strategies and not be so siloed. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people, there are a lot of people doing a lot of good work but if we're doing it siloed, we could be working on the same thing, mm -hmm. right? So there's not, they, they, they probably could be more knowledge sharing. How, how do we make that happen? Do you, I mean, just a quick thought. What, what, if, if, you, if money was not an issue, what, would, what could we do? What should we do? Training. I, I would say training, <laughs> education, yeah. having people, yeah, if your money, then you have, you could have thought leaders and leaders in the community, the, uh, forums like this, where you're sitting down and talking, but then having time to now really develop some solutions that you can then implement. So I think more, more, of, more collaboration, but then the time to really be intentional and spend time looking at the specific issues. Mm -hmm. And, and shifting the focus off of the blame of the client. You know, I see so many times where, oh, this is behavioral. They're med seeking. They're, you know, you can know all those buzzwords where we put the blame on the client for not coming in instead of really identifying what that issue is. So with that, we need training because it's, it's a balance. What I see, the, but I, what I, people will either be too easy, meaning that, oh, they're, so which continues to promote this learned helplessness, mm -hmm. right? And not re because it's like, oh, they're never going to be able to get it, so I got to make it easy. And I have to tolerate behaviors that are not appropriate so that those inappropriate behaviors will continue. Mm -hmm. Instead of understanding, spending time on understanding the challenges, and then coming up with strategies so we can engage people, not in a judgmental way, but and hold people accountable for behaviors. Say there are those that are met seeking, not everyone, but there are those that are met seeking, so what are we doing about those? And how are we helping the people who need help? I have a question that kind of relates to the training and also the <clears throat> what you talked about, Dr. Watley, is the time. Um, I, I know nurses and other healthcare providers were burned out. And so it's really, even if we have the training, it's really hard to actually implement that in the real world and not use, get snappish towards patients or accuse them of being frequent flyers or drug seeking or all of those kinds of things. How do you feel like um, increasing the workforce fits into that so we don't have so many shortages? I was just going to say, definitely, if money was not an object, and we did say that. <laughs> um, definitely, probably workload and work-life balance, because we recognize that that's such an important part. After coming out of, um, you know, COVID and realizing the challenge that where people are, because none of us can be good for anyone, even with the best intentions, if we're not at a place where mentally we're resilient. So. For me as a leader, I have to be, be sure that pay providers understand that. And sometimes it's hard because you're dealing with, you know, with the clinical support is not enough, but we've got to be, you know, we've got to recognize that no matter what, people have got to take their time off. It doesn't matter how strapped you are, right, because you don't want people to leave. What are we doing about retention? So at a more ex executive level, spending that time thinking about those solutions, recognizing that the workforce is a different workforce. 
you know, they're, they want to drop in and drop out. They're not people like I maybe where I'm, I'm, so I think we've got to recognize where, the, where we're moving and so those solutions have to kind of cater to that and it can't be only people like you're making the decision because you're going to come up with solutions that may not work for everyone, you know, so you've got to be really flexible with those workforce things as well. But you could also train the crap out of everybody and have every training, but if there's no implementation, if there's no follow through, if there's no change in your culture of how you're dealing with clients, it's nothing. And, and I think to kind of address your point, I think it, a very important part is, is, do you, is there kind of a case consultation forum? So I know with, like if, if we're, I have a team of therapists, do we meet on a weekly basis to be able to bring up clients and talk with them? I'm having a hard time, you know, with this client. Can we talk this out? How do you deal with these things and sharing and collaborating those things? Because again, training, you could do all that, but if it doesn't go anywhere, it's just kind of a useless things taking up in your head, so. So just give us your final thoughts. What, what would you um, charge us to do, leave us with? What are your final thoughts? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, with, with, I, I think with going back to without that positive support, without, you know, talking amongst ourselves, identifying those, those things, we get lost, and I, and I think this is where that burnout comes. This is where we're starting to blame the clients for what we're doing, and once we get to that point, because I always told myself, the second that I lose any amount of empathy for someone's situation, for someone's plight, for something there, I need to get out, because that's a disservice to me, and that's a disservice to clients. Well, thank you for, you know, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak with you and I would like us to continue to collaborate and if, you know, for our patients, I think for our patients is so essential that at each touch, at every touch point, we, we continue to, ed, to engage them in their health and to understand um, some of the issues that they're going through because things may change or things will change, that's one thing we, and have it, you know, having forums like this where we can bring those things forward so we can work on solutions. Well, thank you, thank you. Good job. Mm -hmm. Clap, 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 clap. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you. So thanks so much again to, to Matt Fox and Dr. Carolyn Watley. And to thanks to all of our presenters, Dr. Yvonne Jackson, Dr. Jim Jackson, earlier this morning for both the Berean Lecture Series last night, as well as the College of Health and Human Services Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Conference. And I want to especially thank Dr. Betty Jackson, who's the College of Health and Human Services Director of the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And Jackson's together. I'm Dennis. Oh, Dr. <laughs> so I've, I've got Jackson on the brain. Dr. Betty Dennis. Uh, uh, who's our Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in the College of Health and Human Services. And I know that, that Joel Krause and Dr. Pamela Wadsworth and Dr. Janet Hahn and others who I'm, I'm sure I'm not acknowledging, Dr. Don Smith, are also members of the College of Health and Human Services and Dr. Yvonne Jackson are also members of the College of Health and Human Services um, DEI committee and help put together both last evening and today. So, so just a round of applause to all of our presenters and all of our leaders. So, and so I'll introduce myself. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Harrison. I use she, her pronouns. I'm proud to be a social worker and a chemical addictions counselor and to be the interim dean of the College of Health and Human Services. And we're really pleased that all of you are here. I was talking to Randy earlier about even though we would, we would hope that this room is filled to capacity, that it's standing room only, we will suffice with leaders who are interested in engaging and then we will invite other people to be part of our cool kids team um, as we go along. So um, thanks so much for attending today's diversity, equity and inclusion conference. I also wanna acknowledge just some of the key touch points. So 
Dr. Jim Jackson, who presented last night and this morning, and thank you, Dr. Wadsworth, for, for the set of Q&A that you presented, which was so insightful. We also have Dr. Jackson's books, Clearing the Fog, available from our community partner, Book, Blog, Book Bug, and this is a bookstore. Um, that we only have available um, by cash or check, but, but also there are signed copies that are available. BookBug was here last night, and so we do have some additional signed copies from Dr. Jackson that are available at that community store. And we were, Dr. Dennis was really intentional about when we had our book club, and uh, that we really want to partner with our community partners. We don't, we don't always want to partner with like the largest capitalist organization in the universe, um, but we want to partner with our community partners. I want to thank Dr. Yvonne Jackson. Um, I really, I love your focus on both equity and justice, and can't we just remove the barriers so that everyone can see the baseball game? And I think that that, um, that really gets at our access and on some of the systemic issues that we're talking about in addition to the, to the micro practice interventions that we need to focus on. Um, thanks so much, Matt, for, Matt and I have had the opportunity to work, to work together for many, many years. So I was so pleased to, yes, to be able to see him here today that how does interprofessional practice actually work? It means that you have to be willing to be in team and to be in communication with one another. And that's something that we're certainly working on. Um, Dr. Ann Chaplo has been working on our intent co-curricular program, which is really focused on how do we replicate what works well in practice in our co-curricular activities. And also that we don't want to just train people. It's not enough. We can train people till we're blue in the face, but if we don't have practice opportunities, which is why we're so pleased that in the College of Health and Human Services, we have 100% experiential learning opportunities. You do not graduate from any program in the College of Health and Human Services without having experience of working under the supervision of a nurse, of a social worker, of a physical therapist in the community, and that's really critical because the folks that we're providing education to are gonna be my nurse and my family members, occupational therapist, and my niece's speech and language pathologist, and, um, and all of that. And also I wanna thank Dr. Carolyn Watley about the importance of balancing high expectations for the people that we serve, and also um, high access and workforce development, that if we're all well-trained. And then finally, I, I love what she said about, you know, we gotta take time off. We got to, as Dr. Jackson was talking about this morning, we got to put on our own oxygen mask or we really can't be there to serve people. And as Matt said, if we lose empathy, we might as well leave. We might as well leave our fields. So um, I think that's part of what we're talking about today. And, and actually, that's part of why we've got snacks and that's part of why we partner with Mimic. And that's part of, we want to we wanna feed you all mind, body, and spirit, um, literally and figuratively. So we're so glad that I'm so glad that my mind and body have both been fed today. So uh, I also want to um, welcome all of you that are here and also to encourage you to tell your friends that we do have one more diversity, equity, and inclusion lunch and learn on Wednesday, April 17th that's downstairs in the Student Engagement Center. Um, we will be continuing to talk about health disparities. This time we'll talk about health literacy with Dr. Dori Rivadas um, and also and, and next year, we have actually most of our DEI Lunch and Learns already planned. Our first one on September 18th is gonna feature, feature Dr. Ali Karoga, who's the president of Corewell Health, um, and talking about health systems and some of those like broader, broader uh, systemic issues. And then um, two other notes. Um, for those of you that are students, and I know we've got several current students, you received a diversity, equity, and inclusion climate survey that was sent out by the DEI committee that put together this, this uh, um, conference. So wanna encourage you to complete that, to tell your friends and your cohort members, to invite them to complete it. We do have a few gift cards that we'll randomly draw for completion of the survey. Um, so much like we did today with, with our partners at Mimic. And then finally, I um, want to encourage everyone, please don't forget to, to um, note the QR code and to fill out an evaluation of today to let us know what we did well, what we can do better next time, and, and how we can be partners with all of you, whether internal or external partners, to make sure that we're, off, that we're advancing health equity, eliminating health disparities, and training our workforce to offer amazing health and human services um, throughout our communities. So thank you so much.